Um, so good evening, everyone. And it is a privilege to have our esteemed speakers today, uh, this evening. Uh, we want to discuss the exciting and ever evolving field of breast cancer. Now, 2001, this year has been really a year of changes. There have been a lot of practicing studies that have come up in the new adjuvant, adjuvant setting, as well as the metastatic setting. And it is overwhelming how much efforts are ongoing to improve outcomes in these subset of patients. I think the meeting today where we have experts from across the country, across the world, we are trying to give all our patients the standard of care, no matter which country they live in. And I think that is a great thing. So today, um, this is our scientific program. We are lucky to have Dr. Shaina Daoud speaking about PARP inhibitors and breast cancer. Then we'll have Dr. Elias Ovid speak about immunotherapy. I think PARP inhibitors and immunotherapy agents have stolen the show in the recent ASCO ESMO meetings. This will be followed by some interactive discussions. We have Dr. Senthil Rajapa moderating a session on the management of locally advanced triple negative breast cancer. And Dr. P.P. Sahu, who will be uh, taking us through management of early and metastatic hormone positive or negative breast cancer. So I thank you all once again, and I welcome Dr. Shaina Daoud to um, start her talk. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. And just let me know if you can actually see my slides. Yes, ma'am. They're good. So um, thank you very much for uh, the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be part of these um, uh, webinars because I think they're focused and it also gives a lot of uh, uh, opportunity for interaction. So my uh, role today is really walk you through PARP inhibitors in breast cancer and um, I, Dr. Shah said that uh, IO sort of stole the show this year. I, I don't quite agree with that. I think PARP inhibitors also had a little bit to play with it. In, both of them, ma'am, both. <laughs> breast cancer. So just to take you um, a step back, um, we know that BRCA-associated tumors such as prostate, pancreatic, ovarian, and breast, there's always been a huge um, interest in these tumors because when they have a BRCA mutation, to PARP inhibitors. And we know way back in 2005, there were two back-to-back -back nature papers that showed some very good preclinical data looking at BRCA1, BRCA2 dysfunction being profoundly, um, uh, the presence of a BRCA1, BRCA2 dysfunction profoundly sensitizing cells to the inhibition of PARP enzymatic activity, which eventually resulted in chromosomal instability, cell cycle arrest, and subsequent apoptosis. And that set the platform for the first phase one trial that actually looked at using PARP inhibitors in BRCA associated tumors um, uh, who are heavily pretreated with PARP inhibitors. And you can see an example here of two patients with ovarian cancer that were treated with PARP inhibitors and actually did very, 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 very well. And this actually, it was data such as this that resulted in PARP inhibitors actually being approved in various settings. Now this set the platform for breast cancer. We know there are two large randomized clinical trials in the setting of metastatic breast cancer, the Olympia D trial and the Embraca trial that randomized patients to physician choice of chemotherapy or PARP inhibitor. These patients had to have platinum sensitive disease. And we know that if they had physician choice of chemotherapy, progression-free survival was approximately five months. Uh, but however, if they got PARP inhibitor, you can see that it improved it to about to an additional three months. Now in 2021, in the metastatic setting, there are a number of different questions that we're gonna ask ourselves. Will PARP inhibitors work post-platinum in the early stage setting? Um, we know that the trials in the metastatic as well as early stage setting did actually involve uh, the use of platinums. Do we need to consider a platinum free interval, perhaps six to 12 months? Should we consider PARP inhibitor in that first line setting in the metastatic setting? We know in the trials, 40% no, there was no previous chemotherapy. Should we consider it in a patient with controlled brain metastases? And can we consider it prior to immunotherapy in those patients with pdl one positive disease who have metastatic disease and who have BRCA mutation? 
So I'm going to walk you through three cases and then take you to the early stage setting just to see how we actually think about our patients. This is a patient, 38-year-old woman, uh, who is had whose mother had ovarian cancer at age 42. She presents with a breast mass in 2018. And after shopping around, we eventually diagnose her to have triple negative breast cancer with lung and liver metastases. Her tumor was actually tested and she had PDL1 positive disease and she had germline BRCA1 as well. So the question is, what would be the most appropriate therapy? Chemo, chemo plus BEV, chemo plus IO therapy, because she's got PDL1 positive disease. Or should we be giving her a PARP inhibitor up front? Now, at that time, we didn't have access to a PARP inhibitor for her specifically due to various issues. And we commenced her on a Braxine, a tezolizumab, based on the Impassion 130 trial. We know there are two positive trials in the metastatic setting for patients with PDL1 positive triple negative breast cancer, the Impassion 130, as well as the Keynote 355, that have shown that if you give chemo plus IO versus chemo alone in these patients with triple negative breast cancer, they have an overall survival advantage. But in patients with BRCA mutation positive disease, if you go back to the Olympiad study, we do know from a subgroup analysis that amongst patients who did not receive any prior chemotherapy, there was a significant improvement in overall survival compared to patients who had prior chemotherapy uh, for uh, their metastatic disease. So the question was, what are we going to do? Like I said, in this particular patient, we did give her a TESO plus BEV. Uh, and, in, uh, and in August 2019, she developed brain metastases. We radiated it. And then eventually in November 2019, uh, she did have progression of her disease in the lung and in the liver. And at that point, we did in fact treat her with a PARP inhibitor. We commenced her on Olaparib and she did very well until July 2020 when she had progression of disease. So she was on PARP for approximately 10 months. Now, if you look at our personalized algorithm, if a patient has metastatic triple negative breast cancer, we test for both BRCA as well as PDL1. If they have PDL1 negative disease and BRCA, we tend to give them a PARP inhibitor up front or platinum based chemotherapy. If they're PDL1 positive, we substratify based on whether they have visceral crisis or not. If they have visceral crisis and they have a germline BRCA, we do give IO plus chemotherapy and then on progression, give them a PARP. Um, but if they have no visceral crisis and their germline mutation positive, we do give them the option of either a PARP or IO therapy. And if you look at the latest 2021 ESMO guidelines, which have literally been published two days ago, you can see that in that first line setting, both options are in fact given. The second case is a woman with a hormone receptor positive HER2 negative disease. In 2015, she presented with a breast mass. It was no positive hormone receptor positive HER2 negative stage three breast cancer. She's treated with chemo, surgery, radiation, as well as tamoxifen. She has a strong family history of breast cancer and she was tested. She had BRCA2 mutation positive disease. At that point, she had re uh, refused either GNRH analog or removal of her ovaries. By September of 2020, unfortunately, her disease recurred. She had pleural effusion as well as liver metastases. She was biopsied and we sent her tissue for profiling. And you can see that she has hormone receptor positive disease. She's got a somatic BRCA2 mutation as well as germline. And you can see she also has the PIK3CA mutation. Now, at this point, we discussed what are we going to give her chemo, CDK4-6, uh, PARP inhibitor, uh, or just simply endocrine therapy plus a PIK3CA uh, inhibitor. At this point, we did uh, discuss her case in our MDT. You know, there's a lot of real world evidence that actually suggests that in patients with germline mutation positive disease, if you give them a PARP, if you give them a CDK4-6 inhibitor, their uh, pro progression-free survival and their overall survival is actually less than patients who have wild type disease in that cohort who actually gets a CDK4-6 uh, inhibitor. Anyway, despite that, we gave her uh, Femara for CDK4-6. At this point, she did have her ovaries removed because she was premenopausal at the time of diagnosis. That was in September 2020. By March 2021, she had progression of her disease, extensive liver metastases, and a deranged liver function. Question is, what were we going to do? Chemotherapy, PARP, 
or combination uh, endocrine therapy. Remember, she does have a PIK3CA mutation. Now, remember her progression-free survival in CDK4-6 was actually quite short, begging the question, would uh, uh, alpalisib actually work? Some very interesting data from the BILEAF trial presented at ASCO that actually showed that it didn't really matter what your duration of CDK4-6 inhibitor was prior. You did benefit from uh, alpalisib. You can see a PFS of approximately eight months. So, it, so potentially we could have used that here. We know from the Olympia D trial for for patients with hormone receptor positive disease, PFS is about 8.3 months when you use a laparib. In this case, remember her liver function was deranged, so we decided to give her chemotherapy because she was in visceral crisis. Um, and at that point, after we got her out of visceral crisis, the question was, what are we going to do? So at that point, we actually extrapolated from the polo trial. Remember, the polo trial looked at maintenance of laparib amongst patients with germline uh, mutation positive metastatic pancreatic cancer. And you can see that there was an improvement in progression-free survival when you maintain these patients on a laparib. And that's what we did. We extrapolated from that data and we maintained her on, uh, on uh, Olaparib um, in May 2021, and she continues to be uh, in remission. The third case, and the reason why I bring this case up is, remember all the data is for germline mutation positive disease. And in this patient, she's a 60-year-old woman with hormone receptor positive disease, stage four de novo, treated with CDK4-6 inhibitor and, and an AI and progressed. When she came to me, I did biopsy her. I sent her tissue off for profiling and she had a bracket two somatic mutation. We tested her germline. She did not have a mutation germline. So can it work? Well, we do have the results of the TBCRC048 trial that actually looked at using a laparib in patients with somatic BRCA1 or even germline PALB2, and you can see very impressive overall responses. Um, so that's exactly what we did here. We did give her uh, a PARP inhibitor with, uh, first we gave her a uh, fulvestrin, she didn't respond to it, and then we gave her a laparib, and she had a decent progression-free survival uh, for about seven months. Now, if you go back to the ESMO 2021 guidelines, like I said, literally published a couple of days ago, they actually give you the option of somatic or uh, germline mutation, BRCA1, BRCA2, as well as PALB2, where you can potentially use a PARP inhibitor. And interestingly, in that second line, they've actually given you the option of using a PARP inhibitor straight after CDK4-6. When you look at the ASCO guidelines that were published in July, they actually say if you have a germline BRCA1, BRCA2, you can use an oral PARP as monotherapy may be offered in the first line all the way to through the third line. So you have that option if you wanted. Now that was for the metastatic setting. We know the data is strong. The question is, could we effectively use a PARP inhibitor in the early stage setting as well? We know we have improved the prognostic outcome of patients in the early stage setting who have HER2 negative disease. Could we incorporate PARP inhibitors in that BRCA mutation positive cohort and further improve prognostic outcome? We do have the results at ASCO this year, 2021, and simultaneously published in the New England Journal of Medicine of the Olympia trial. Patients with HER2 negative disease, germline BRCA1 or BRCA2, high risk cohort of patients after completing their neoadjuvant or adjuvant therapy randomized to either a laparib or placebo. Median age of the cohort was 42, 60% were premenopausal, and 80% had triple negative disease. And you can see in terms of the primary endpoint, IDFS benefit at three years of 8.8% with a very strong trend towards improvement in the overall survival. And you can see across the subgroups, didn't really matter her hormone receptor positive or triple neg, whether you received prior adjuvant or neoadjuvant or whatever BRCA you had, you were still benefiting from the use of adjuvant laparib. But putting this into context, what about other therapeutic modalities? We know in the, in the setting of high-risk triple negative disease, this year at ESMO in the virtual plenary session, we saw the event-free survival data for Keynote 522, looking at the incorporation of immunotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting in high-risk triple negative. You can see that in terms of event-free survival, there was a benefit. Specifically, you can see that in those patients who had residual disease, if you, if you gave them immunotherapy, there was a benefit in terms of outcome. 
What about your high risk hormone receptor positive uh, disease patients? Again, ESMO virtual plenary, literally a week ago, we saw the updated results of the Monarch E trial that showed that adjuvant abima three years IDFS 88.8% versus 83.4% when you gave adjuvant endocrine therapy alone. Again, this was a high risk group, 5.4% absolute benefit. And again, FDA has approved the use of adjuvant abima. Why am I talking about these two trials? Because going forward, we're gonna to have to ask ourselves some very important questions. Among patients with TMBC who receive new adjuvant therapy and have residual disease, what is the optimal adjuvant strategy? You have data from CreateX where you can give capecitabine three-year uh, event-free survival 70%, Keynote 522, adjuvant pembrolizumab 67.4%, and now we have Olympia in that bracket, a positive cohort, it's 81%. So what is the optimal strategy? Is it olaparib, capecitabine, pembrolizumab, or perhaps a combination of pembrolizumab plus olaparib We'll never know the right answer because those trials will never be conducted. But this is the potential algorithm that we tend to follow at my institute. If you have not received IO in the neoadjuvant setting and you have residual disease and are BRCA positive, you get a laparib. Um, if you have achieved a PCR but have a very, very high risk of, uh, of triple negative, say suppose you have N3 disease but achieved a PCR, you may consider adjuvant laparib. If you've received neoadjuvant IO and you've had a residual disease and you're BRCA positive, again, either a laparib or IO therapy, or perhaps even a combination of the two, if you have achieved a PCR and a very high risk, again, you could potentially consider it. Among patients with high risk hormone receptor positive, what is the ideal adjuvant therapy? Monarch E, 92.2% three-year event-free survival, and Olympia, 83.5%. But remember, Monarch E, we don't know what the BRCA cohort actually showed. Again, what is the most optimal strategy? Is it adjuvant to laparib, adjuvant CDK4-6 plus endocrine therapy, or will you sequence? And there's been a lot of debate about whether you start with a laparib going to a BEMA or a BEMA going to a laparib. At least for us, our algorithm, I'm not going to go through this in detail, we give adjuvant abima when we have four lymph nodes that are positive or more and other high-risk features who have BRCA negative disease. Adjuvant to laparib when you have that high-risk cohort again who are BRCA positive, and we may consider adjuvant abima post or laparib. Finally, among patients with high-risk TNBC who receive neoadjuvant therapy and achieves a PCR, would you not give adjuvant PARP inhibitor? I've just told you that we may in fact consider that and among patients with high-risk HER2 negative disease and a PALB2 mutation, would you consider giving adjuvant PARP inhibitor? We're already doing it in the metastatic setting. We're never going to get that trial in the early stage setting. I would personally do it, but it is up for debate. So finally, these are my take-home messages. We know that PARP inhibitors has been shown to be associated with improved prognostic outcome amongst patients with BRCA mutation HER2 negative MBC. We know in the metastatic setting, PARP inhibitors has shown activity in patients among, uh, among patients with both somatic as well as germline mutation. And we've also seen that TRBC data that shows that there is activity with PALB2 mutation. Adjuvant PARP among patients with BRCA mutations who have high risk HER2 negative disease certainly improves prognostic outcome. I think these are practice changing data, but going forward, appropriate integration and sequencing of neoadjuvant and adjuvant strategies with IO as well as adjuvant CDK4-6 will be key in improving prognostic outcome. So thank you very much, and I hope I didn't exceed time. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shaina, for the nice uh, presentation. So once you um, can I, uh, I just had actually a, uh, a question for Dr. Shaina Daud. Yes, um, so, you know, with the um, TNBC in the new adjuvant setting, I think most of the trials now have made carboplatin like a standard of care. So just Absolutely. wanted to know how you are incorporating platinums in your practice for the new adjuvant setting for TNBC patients. So at least for me, I've been incorporating platinums for the last four years in my clinic. Um, I know there's been a lack of consensus simply because number one, we only had PCR improvement first from the CLGB, the JAPR 6 study and the brightness trial. But there was always this fear as well about the toxicities related to addition of platinum. But if you look at 
all those trials, including the control arm of Keynote 522, PCR with a carbo with addition of platinum, either weekly or three weekly carboplatin is about 50%, something that you don't get if you don't add a platinum. So if you can't afford IO therapy, at least add platinum, you are improving the PCR rate. And this year at ESMO, we saw the updated results of brightness that shows that the event-free survival is also improved when you add platinum now. So it's not only improvement of PCR, it's also translating into improvement of event-free survival. Now with Keynote 522, the backbone is platinum. If you're going to use immunotherapy in that neoadjuvant setting, you're going to have to use platinum as well and add pembrolizumab. Although some people may argue that the Japrinuvo trial only used a taxane anthracycline-based therapy and added uh, dervolumab without the platinum. So again, that may be a controversy, but I think with brightness, with the event-free survival benefit and with Keynote 522, all my patients with triple negative, if they are candidates for neoadjuvant, will receive neoadjuvant platinum. Okay, makes sense. And so, so weekly Paclitaxel plus carboplatin is what yes. you usually use? So I use weekly Paclitaxel at 80 milligrams per meter square and carboplatin I don't like the every three week regimen, quite honestly. I think it's more toxic. I use uh, carboplatin and AUC of anywhere between 1.5 to 2, depending on what patients can tolerate. And honestly, patients tolerate it, in fact, very, very well, especially when you start off with it and then go on to the anthracyclines. Okay, okay. Uh, Dr. Shaina, uh, I have a question uh, regarding uh, the, the choosing the drug between the Olapare versus Abima. Now we have a monarchy and we have a Yes. So how, uh, because now in 2020, when I'm talking, if you're currently patient, how do you choose if the patient fitting with the both ethics? So number one, Olympia and uh, Monarch E both chose very high risk group of patients. So it's not your run of the mill, you know, hormone receptor positive. They either had to have four lymph nodes positive or, or if they got neoadjuvant therapy, a lot of uh, residual disease co uh, cohort uh, group of patients. If they have a... BRCA mutation positive disease. Personally, in my view, looking at the metastatic setting, the CDK4-6 inhibitors and endocrine therapy doesn't seem to work that well. I mean, I've shown you that data and I wish I'd had more time. I would have shown you even more data to try and convince you that it doesn't work as well as we think in those germline mutation positive patients. And me specifically, I will use now a PARP inhibitor first there is the option, and I think it's a very good option. We will never have the data for it because it's just too hard to conduct those trials. I think that if you are, your patient is at a very, very high risk, it is reasonable after that one year of a lap rib to then continue and give a bemaciclib plus um, endocrine therapy. I think that's very reasonable. I've also heard, and I, and I wish I had more time because I just gave this talk today morning at my Congress of how to sequence therapy in these patients. But you could even think about starting off with a Bima Cyclip first and going on to taking a laparib. But remember, I showed you that data in the metastatic setting, CDK46, you have half the PFS yes. in the germline mutation versus wild type. So for me personally, I'd start off with a laparib and sequence it with uh, a Bima Cyclip uh, if the patient was at very, very high risk. I think the laparib is the more important treatment there. You switch after one year. Or three years. Yes, for sure. After one year, I would not you do the two together. You would crash yes. your patient's bone marrow very quickly. Absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, a, a beam, like a beam, got FDA approval just today yes, in sir. the adjuvant setting. Yes. I think this. I feel like now there are so many different options that it's really confusing how to use them. Uh, so yeah, I think. That's I, but it's interesting. <laughs> No, thank you so much, Dr. David. I think that was great. And um, I think we're... Uh, we're my head word with Dr. Elias, he's joining uh, in a minute or two. Okay, okay. So I think we'll wait for him to join so that we can have his opinion on immunotherapy. Uh, Dr. David, if I mean, I'm sorry, I'm like picking your brains, oh, but while fine. we're waiting, what do you think about the Keynote 522 approval? I mean, so I think the Keynote 522 should have been approved a long time ago. I was very happy to see the Keynote 522 approval. Anything that improves uh, prognostic outcome in patients with triple negative, high risk triple negative uh, disease is welcome. 
but there's going to be a lot of debate what to do after the neoadjuvant setting. And I just put some of the questions that I think are very important in my presentation. One, what are you going to do with those patients who have residual disease, especially if they have BRCA mutation positive disease? Are you going to give them a laparib or pembrolizumab? Are you going to combine the two? And if they have hormone receptor positive disease, what are you going to do in those patients? Um, so that's the first question. I think that's very important. But I think the more important question, especially in the realm of financial toxicity, is in those PCR patients. In patients who achieve a pathological complete response, do they need to continue that one year of pembrolizumab? If you look at the Japernuvo trial, I know it's phase two trial, but if you look at it, they didn't use adjuvant durvulumab. They only used neoadjuvant durvulumab. And if you see the event-free survival and the overall survival they got in the pathological complete response cohort, very similar, if not better, than the keynote 522, really begging the question, do we need to? And so if my patients don't have the money for the adjuvant section, and if they've got a PCR, I advise them to continue, but I'm not unhappy if they don't continue a pembrolizumab in that adjuvant setting. And I think that is the question that we're going to all be asking ourselves. I, I think that makes intuitive sense that if you have a PCR, um, maybe maybe you can stop the pembro and you know de-escalate therapy from there onwards. But yeah, a lot of questions and hopefully the next few years, I don't know. I mean, I, I think those clinical trials will be very hard to <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Your experience of combination of Pembro with Ola? Yes, I've actually done quite a bit of Pembrolizumab and Olaparib. I have to admit, completely off-label. Um, having said that, we do have uh, the, 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 the Tapasio trial and the Mediola trial that shows that it's safe to combine PARP inhibitor and immunotherapy. So I have to admit that I do have some patients who are mutation positive, uh, in that uh, triple negative breast cancer realm, in the in the and you know in the in the adjuvant setting where I have combined PARP and olaparib, and I'm very comfortable doing it. But I have a disclaimer. I do tell my patients it's not standard of care, but I have done it. I will be. I'll be very honest about that. Interesting, ma'am. Thank you. So, Dr. Mansi, now I think we have a Dr. Elias is here. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. So uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Elias Ubit, and uh, it's my pleasure to invite him. So Dr. Elias Ubit is a consultant medical oncologist at Fox Chase Cancer Center. He's the interim chief uh, division of breast medical oncology, and he's assistant professor department of clinical genetics, and he's a director of breast, ovary, and prostate cancer risk assessment. With this, uh, I invite Dr. Elias Obiet. Uh, sir, over to you. Dr. Elias. Levin, please check, sir, is there? Uh, Dr. Elias, can you please unmute yourself? Please. Good morning. Can you, can, you, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, sure. All right. Just trying to get the source for the camera. It seems to me that my camera is uh, uh, not... Just one second. Sorry about that. Technical. Uh, no problem, Dr. Elias. Can you guys see my, my uh, slides though? Yeah, sure, so we can see the yeah. slides. All right, so instead of wasting time trying to figure out where my, uh, which video camera is showing, I'm just gonna go ahead with the, with the, with the slides, is that okay? Yeah, it's okay, sir, please go ahead, sir. All right, everyone. Well, I want to thank everyone for inviting me for this uh, conference and, uh, you know, I was asked to uh, discuss advances in, in immunotherapy and breast cancer. Uh, so we will go over some of the details in the next 20 minutes. And uh, here are the list of my disclosures, uh, we have the same slides. And the agenda for today is to discuss updates on immunotherapy and breast cancer, particular focus on neoadjuvant uh, treatment uh, and IO therapy in breast cancer. So 
I borrowed the slide uh, from uh, 2012 from Doug Hannan and, and Lisa Cousins, where just to show you the different processes in uh, cancer in general, almost in every step, uh, immune infiltrating cells are kind of involved, whether it's in uh, sustaining protective signaling, resisting cell death, uh, activating uh, metastasis. Uh, evading uh, growth suppressors, avoiding immune destruction, etc. So we know that all those immune cells are somewhere. So that's why we are looking at immunotherapy in almost every disease now. And some of the studies have been successful, some, some have not. Now, in particular for breast cancer, why has there been an interest? Uh, you know, you know, there's, there's some seminal work that has been shown regarding lymphocytic infiltrates in breast cancers. And what was seen almost in the last decade was that there is a clinical benefit uh, seen even with incremental increase in tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, particularly in triple negative breast cancer, also in HER2 positive breast cancer treated with lesozumab based therapies, not so much with hormone receptor positive breast cancer. And, and that's why the research in immunotherapy has focused mostly on triple negative breast cancer, a little bit less on hormone reset on HER2 uh, positive breast cancer. So the majority of the discussion I'm going to have today is going to be on triple negative breast cancer and IO therapy. So this is a table just to show you a little bit of uh, what happened between 2014 with the first presentation regarding the first immunotherapy trial and later on uh, regarding monotherapy in triple negative breast cancer. Keynote 012 uh, showed that there was a significant objective response rate of 18.5%. Uh, Keynote 086 had two different cohorts. There's the uh, non-treated before as well as pdl one positive, showed also significant objective response rate to monotherapy, but those with pretreatment and uh, no pdl one expression did not have enough uh, response rates. Uh, Keynote 28, which looked at homoreceptor positive, again, very humble uh, responses. Uh, Avelumab also had very uh, low responses, uh, a little bit better in the uh, triple negative uh, breast cancer uh, subtype. So uh, what happened, you know, what we realized is that immunotherapy alone might not be the way to go. Combination is uh, the way to go. And also that this disease uh, treatment should be biomarker driven. But uh, some of the questions that still remain is which biomarkers to use. So who should receive immunotherapy? So it's still, you know, there are some questions I'm just putting out here. Uh, should be enrichment for selection versus highly usable clinical biomarker. Uh, TILS, uh, still important, but it's not very well explored yet. Uh, PDL1 has been explored. We know it's not the perfect biomarker. We've seen two different PDL1 testing for the same uh, uh, disease, uh, triple negative breast cancer. Um, there might be other things to look for, like antibodies, antigens, uh, MSI, new antigens, mutational burden, etc. So there's definitely a need for further treatment. And we know that chemotherapy is needed, targeted therapy with immunotherapy is needed. So why chemotherapy and which chemotherapy drugs? So in this very nice schematic representation, I can just show you that having different chemotherapy drugs would have a different effect on different processes in the tumor microenvironment. For example, Gemcitabine and endocycline enhance cross primary. Gemcitabine, uh, cisplatin, uh, uh, doxorubicin would have an effect on MDSC activity. Uh, Tetras, uh, so dexanes, uh, tetracyclines would uh, augment uh, dendritic cells activation, etc. So really, every you know different uh, chemotherapy drugs might have different effects in different processes, and you can see that the process of immune cell interaction in the tumor microenvironment is a complex one, and that's why I think just thinking out you know chemotherapy and immunotherapy without really having a significant reasoning behind it makes us not really successful. And I think we have to be very selective in how uh, we select our chemotherapy drugs. 
So pembrolizumab in metastatic triple negative breast cancer, when it was, um, <clears throat> I mentioned the keynote 12 and 86, monotherapy not very effective. This was even further uh, explored in keynote 119's trial. So pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy did not show improvement in objective response rate, PFS or OS. And however, atezolizumab, which is an anti-PDL1 antibody, in the Impassion 130 trial, uh, that was a randomized, double blind, placebo controlled, uh, showed uh, a significant improvement in PFS, uh, in particular patient population that is PDL1 positive by their definition. And that granted an FDA accelerated approval for atezolizumab with net paclitaxel for metastatic PDL1 positive triple negative breast cancer, and that was in March 2019. This is the, just a reminder, the schema for impassion 130. So a tezo with napactic taxol versus placebo napactic taxol, previously untreated metastatic triple negative breast cancer, regardless of PDL1 status, but stratified by PDL1. And here's where you see. Um, this is the progression-free survival, the improvement, 7.5 months versus five, and also an overall survival in the PDL1 positive, you can see the separation in the curve. So what happened is that parallel, there was a, another trial by Genpec uh, in passion 131, which was a phase three randomized trial of atezolizumab with paclitaxel not with net paclitaxel. So with paclitaxel, uh, remember patients are getting paclitaxel were receiving steroids um, and same patient population. What they did is with the results from Impassion 130, they revised the protocol with the main endpoint changed from the original PFS of the intention to treat to PFS of the PDL1 positive population, and they increased the sample size to uh, you know, get more patients and more PDL1 positive patients. What they found was that atezolizumab paclitaxel did not significantly reduce the risk of cancer progression, and that was in 2020. Uh, and therefore, there was a statement by the FDA, a statement of caution. Uh, in fact, when they looked at the overall survival, there was maybe numerical detriment uh, to adding atezolizumab uh, as opposed to uh, placebo. And we have seen that just in August of this year, Genentech announced a voluntary withdrawal uh, of the US accelerated approval for atezolizumab in combination with nap paclitaxel and metastatic triple negative breast cancer. So this is significant because we've, we were able to use nap paclitaxel and atezolizumab for a period of time, and now we cannot in the United States because this was uh, withdrawn. So in the same time, we have seen Keynote 355 trial, that's pembrolizumab and type PD-1, which evaluated the efficacy and safety of pembro plus chemotherapy versus placebo plus chemotherapy uh, in the first line treatment of patients with advanced or metastatic triple negative breast cancer. And this landed in November 2020, accelerated approval by the FDA for pembrolizumab with uh, companion chemotherapy. Uh, these are, this is the schema of this study, and uh, there were three different uh, chemotherapy uh, partners, either napaclitaxel or paclitaxel or gemcitabine plus carboplan. The study did not look to see which regimen is better. It was just any of those plus pembrolizumab versus any of those plus placebo until progression. And certainly it showed an improvement in PFS in patients with a CPS score of 10 or more, PDL1 positive. And that's another definition for PDL1 positivity for the pembrolizumab companion diagnostic test. Um, and this is not something for, for us to discuss, but just to show you how many clinical trials have been, uh, all those studies I discussed, the major ones in the metastatic uh, you know, population. Now, what about early stage triple negative breast cancer? And this is really important. It remains a disease that is you know, uh, with a high risk of recurrence. So I think the better we can do in early stage, the less we will have in the metastatic setting, 
That's what we've seen with the HER2 positive breast cancer. So any improvement we can do in early stage could translate to improvement in outcomes and decreasing recurrence. This is a list of the different clinical trials that have been looking or still are looking at uh, the neoadjuvant or early stage immunotherapy combination uh, uh, chemotherapy. And I'm gonna discuss a few of those. So just to give you a little bit of an idea here now, so I already showed you that first-line treatment of metastatic you know, PD-L1 positive triple negative breast cancer, looking at this balance, so in passion 130, keynote 355 are effective, in passion 131 is ineffective, it actually made, uh, it is a, actually uh, voluntarily withdraw their, um, uh, their uh, approval. In the pre-treated, in the pre-treated uh, single agent immunotherapy, no benefit, so we don't do that. Uh, and then in the early uh, triple negative breast cancer, two trials have been reported in uh, 2019, uh, Keynote 522 and Neotrip. One showed uh, that is effective, the other was ineffective. So I'm gonna go over those. So there was several trials. One is a phase one clinical trial that looked at neoadjuvant Pembro plus chemo uh, with or without carboplatin, uh, with or without uh, napactidaxel. Uh, some of them, some of the arms had napactidaxel and carboplatin. Some of the arms had uh, paclitaxel and carboplatin and some of the arms had no cover plan. And in general, it did show it improvement in PCR. Those were very few patients, so it's a small phase one study that was at the basis of the launching the phase three trial. At the same time, the ISPY2 trial, which is an ad adaptive clinical trial, it also showed that adding uh, pembrolizumab to the standard pactodaxel and uh, anthracycline-based chemotherapy in the new adjuvant setting improved uh, uh, the outcomes of PCR, so pathologic complete response rate in patients with triple negative breast cancer. So this is the Neotrip trial. So this is a uh, trial of etosuvizumab added to carboplatin and napactodaxel. So simple uh, backbone uh, versus carboplatin and napactodaxel. Patients then had surgery, then received anthracycline, and then had follow-up. What happened is, looking at the characteristics of the patients in this clinical trial, I just wanted to point out three things. So, uh, PD-L1 positivity was about 56% in general in the population. Locally advanced was in about 49%. And you can see here that uh, clinical uh, node zero was only 13%. So the majority of the patients in the trial had no positive disease. What they found was that with atezolizumab, there was a 2.63% increase in uh, uh, PCR rate. That's pretty low. Uh, they were not expecting that. And if you look at the PCR rate, by PDL1 expression, uh, slightly you know, improvement, uh, you know, 51.9 versus 48 in PDL1 positive, but there's no difference in the PDL1 negative. By stage, also in the early high risk, so the lower risk patients, maybe slight improvement, not really in the locally advanced. Keep in mind, most of the patients were locally advanced in this trial. And they had a multivariate analysis, which showed that PDL1 was the only factor that affected the response rate. So, Neotrip showed addition of atezo to napactidaxel and carbo did not significantly increase the rate of PCR. And in multivariate analysis, the presence of PDL1 expression was the most significant factor influencing rate of PCR. So, Keynote 522 is different. Keynote 522 gave uh, patients a backbone of uh, carboplatin plus paclitaxel, then uh, doxorubicin and cyclophosphamide. So you can see that anthracycline was added to the neoadjuvant 
uh, backbone. So we have four chemo drugs, not something that we do often, right? We usually do a taxane, then or uh, anthracycline, cyclophosphamide. So here patients received carbo in addition, uh, and that was in both the control arm and the experimental arm. So in the experimental arm, patients received Pembro and continued Pembro for the remainder of a year, uh, placebo uh, in the you know, adjuvant and did not receive uh, Pembro in the post-surgery. What uh, we see here in terms of characteristics, I just want to show you this and compare it to the Neotrip uh, population, 81%, so much more patients here had pd one positivity. And also uh, in terms of node negativity here, 48%, whereas it was 13% in the Neotrip trial. So there's an imbalance, so more chemo, adding carbo, and AC, as opposed to just carbo and taxane. So carbo tax, taxane and AC, and less risky population, more PDL1 positive. So please keep note of that. Definitive PCR analysis, a delta of 13.6% in um, general patient population. Uh, by disease stage, almost in all disease stages, 2A, 2B, 3A, 3B, all of them had a significant improvement in the delta. Um, by PDL1 expression, uh, all of them, even in the PDL1 negative, there was an improvement, 18%. And in the PDL1 positive, the more PDL1 positive, the higher the response rate in terms of PCR. And even looking at whether patients received the full chemotherapy schedule or less, maybe because of toxicity, they still had similar changes. So, Really, this is an important trial, near yeah, adjuvant pembro plus chemo. Keep in mind, chemo was hefty, carbotaxing plus AC, uh, showed a benefit of improving PCR versus chemo alone. The benefit of near adjuvant chemo and the pembro on PCR was also observed in patients who received less than the planned chemotherapy. Um, so before going on to tell you what happened with the FDA, I'll tell you about that later. Let's talk about Impassion 031. So Impassion 031 is another neoadjuvant Atezo trial. So I think Atezo was, you know, the, the king of the land at the time. They had the approval in the metastatic triple negative. They were doing more trials. So in the neoadjuvant setting, they had this clinical trial of atezolizumab as uh, in the experimental arm versus placebo. In the chemotherapy backbone was the standard of care, uh, a taxane, but they used nap taxol with followed by doxorubicin cyclophosphamide. So no platinum compound in this trial. So standard nap taxol, doxorubicin cyclophosphamide with atezo, and then surgery, and then continued atezo for the rest of the year. Uh, you can see that they did some kind of an adaptive enrichment. So they had they added more PDL1 patients throughout the study. They also increased the sample size after that. And you can see here that in terms of PDL1 positivity, still it wasn't that uh, that PDL1 uh, enriched. Uh, just about 45% uh, of the patients were PDL1 positive. And uh, as opposed to the Neotrip trial, they had less, uh, uh, they had much more patients with no negative and much less patients with no positive disease. So they kind of improved this, the, you know, made it less risky patient population, but they didn't really increase their PDL1 uh, cohort. In general, this is the result. The delta is 16.5%, uh, you know, in this trial. Uh, and you can see that uh, with, um, and with with uh, nineteen point five percent PCR in PDL one positive, in PDL one negative, still it was significant thirteen percent improvement. So similar data in a, in a way to the Pembro data, but here this is without a platinum compound. Uh, Atezolizumab plus chemotherapy resulted in a statistically significant and clinically meaningful sixteen point five percent increase in PCR uh, versus placebo chemotherapy. And the benefit was observed regardless of PDL1 status. So similar to what we've seen with the Kino trial. So here's a summary. Neotrip did not show benefit. Uh, 
in, in Passion 031, you see that benefit about 60%. In the Keynote 532, you see the, the benefit also about 14%. Um, you know, I don't want to go and bore you out with the details of this Guepar Nuevo trial, which is a small phase two trial. Uh, what is interesting about the Guepar, uh, Guepar Nuevo, which was just reported recently in ESMO, is that they did a window of opportunity here, which basically they started patients on Dervalumab, uh, which is an anti pdl one uh, before even starting chemotherapy. So patients received one injection of Derva or placebo, then Derva with nap paclitaxel, then Derva with anthracycline-based chemotherapy, then surgery. And what was interesting also is that you see at three years uh, improvement in uh, IDFS, DDFS, and overall survival. And that's stratified by kills. I'm going to skip through this just to give you just a summary of the Guepard Nevo that um, that Dervalumab added to new adjuvant chemotherapy again without platinum significantly improved survival, uh, IDFS, DDFS, and overall survival. Uh, the patients with PCR seem to have a better survival with Dervalumab than PCR. Uh, uh, the patients on placebo, and the value of PDL1 for long-term outcome needs still to be explored. They don't know. Um, but, you know, there's, it raises a nice you know, question, should you start immunotherapy even before starting chemotherapy? That's a question that has been asked in the field, but no, had, no one had the answer to it. So in February 2021, the Oncology Drug Advisory Committee in the United States on, for the FDA uh, for the supplementary listing application of pembrolizumab for new adjuvant therapy unanimously voted against approval of pembrolizumab. In May 2021, not too long ago, Merck announced the results of further follow-up from their phase three keynote 522 uh, trial. So there was more uh, uh, mature uh, events, uh, free survival data, and that they met the primary, the primary or the co-primary uh, endpoint of event-free survival, which showed an improvement in event-free survival with the high-risk early-stage triple negative breast cancer. And in July 2021, the FDA approved pembrolizumab for high-risk early-stage triple negative breast cancer in combination with chemotherapy. That's what it is. But based on the trial, that chemotherapy was carbotax, the taxane, plus or followed by anthracycline cyclophosphamide. So, you know, here we go. That's the landscape so far in uh, October 2021. Uh, you know, just to put this here, failure of the Neotrip uh, to confirm the results of Keynote 522. However, you know, I think it's balanced out by the Impassion 031, uh, you know, with a different, uh, slight different design. Uh, but I think that some of the failure is partially due to baseline imbalances between those uh, uh, two clinical trials. Otherwise, we might have been able to see consistent results all throughout. Uh, but, you know, I was happy to see the Impassion 031 being similar in a way to, to Keynote 522. For those of us who, who are thinking about, can we just avoid giving carboplatin? Uh, you know, that is a question that is yet to be answered, and I don't have the, the, the answer to that, but I just gave you the background information of uh, all of that. And with this, I want to thank you for the invitation, and I hope I was able to clarify and give you a little bit of a good background on, uh, on uh, the advances in immunotherapy and breast cancer. So thank you so much, Dr. Obeid. Uh, it was wonderful to uh, listen to your presentation. And uh, I think uh, we have the um, chance to ask Dr. Obeid any questions in terms of immunotherapy, especially in the early stage cancer, since I think there have been a lot of discussions. Dr. Santil and Dr. Amish Vora, you have been a part of recent meetings where we've discussed the Keynote 522 trial. Um, so if uh, anybody has any questions, please feel free. And Dr. Obi, just uh, out of curiosity, barring the FDA approval, if you um, is neoadjuvant immunotherapy now kind of like the standard of care uh, for triple negative breast cancers in the neoadjuvant setting at your institute? 
Or yes, no? yes, we are. So basically, we are discussing it with our patients, obviously, for stage uh, two uh, and about breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer, we are discussing it. Almost all our surgeons are referring the patients to us. In a way, this was similar to what happened with the Catherine uh, trial results from for her to positive breast cancer. So the surgeons are now sending patients to us for discussion for new adjuvant treatment given the, you know, the changes. Uh, so now we do that with our patients. Uh, most patients really, really are impressed by the results of immunotherapy. I think there's a lot of uh, uh, interest by patients and many of them take it. Now, what have we done? Uh, again, this is a new thing, right? I mean, it just happened in July. Uh, since the, what happened, I'll tell you in my own practice, I had patients on new adjuvant. Uh, therapy, I added pembrolizumab. I did not necessarily add carboplatin uh, for their care. Uh, I think some of the struggles remain about carboplatin. Do we really need to use carbo in every patient? It's a, it's a difficult uh, question. I think the approval was based on the trial that, um, that had carboplatin as part of the regimen. But again, uh, you know, whether or not carboplatin and anthracycline both played a role in improving the benefit of pembrolizumab. I think that remains as the, the question uh, that is yet to be answered. Um, I would not hesitate at adding carboplatin to uh, a stage three or uh, to a patient with a BRCA1 or two mutation. I, I might uh, be a little bit more, you know, reluctant with a you know smaller tumor, maybe even with node involvement. But I think uh, we can we usually discuss that with the patient and uh, probably decide uh, maybe either dropping it if they have significant toxicity or uh, you know uh, not starting it together. Mansi, can I ask a question to Dr. Sure, Obid? sure, sure. Yeah, Dr. Obid, uh, very nice presentation. Uh, you know, I spy two uh, without platinum. Uh, the PCR in TNBC increased three times. Uh, in Keynote 522 with platinum, 15 to 16% PCR rate. My question is, do you think if we add pembrolizumab, it negates or it overcomes the advantage of platinum? Because if you see the PCR rate of ISPI, and if you compare with PCR rate of key, key 522, they are not too much of difference. So my question is, if you are adding pembrolizumab outside the setting of clinical trial, say in uh, not LABC, but in EBC, uh, do we re really require platinum? Yeah, so, so I think the reason I highlighted in passion 031 is really just to look particularly at that, that even without platinum compound, with the similar you know, patient population, of course, with about two different immunotherapy drugs, one is a PD-1 inhibitor, the other is a PD-L1 inhibitor, we still we saw very similar changes in PCR and event PCR. So the, the numbers are very similar. Uh, the new trip, I think, was um, we've got a, what I would call a fluke in the in that uh, setting, just because of the design of the trial, the way they selected the patients uh, was probably what made that uh, difference, basically, in the results. So um, you know, I I think there is still some benefit for platinum compounds. I think we are all struggling with adding platinum compound or not. Now, I want to remind you that there was a study. Uh, by ECOG that recently got reported where platinum compound was, so carboplatin was compared to uh, capecitabine in the adjuvant setting in patients who received new adjuvant chemotherapy. So those are patients with triple negative breast cancer getting new adjuvant treatment, surgery, and then if there is a residual disease, so high risk, they received either carbo or uh, capecitabine. And this study was actually, uh, it failed. And this was just reported uh, not too long, just like I think at uh, ASCO, so just a few months ago. So, so we know uh, that uh, platinum might work for some patients, but not for everyone. And I think we still need more biomarker analysis just to understand who would benefit from any platinum compounds or not. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Obid, for your time. Uh, I think this has been a really interesting discussion. And uh, Dr. Ashish Pashar, if you want to... Uh... Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Obid.
is Ashisha there? Okay. Uh, so I think we are going to go ahead with our next panel discussion on the management of locally advanced PNBC after our last few talks on PARP inhibitors and immunotherapy. If I may invite Dr. Sentil to moderate the session with Dr. Uh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I was just inviting the panelists, but uh, Dr. Amish Vora is there, Dr. Krupa Shankar is there, and I'm there. So it's up to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amish. <laughs> we are back again. <laughs> okay, so the same keynote 522 group is back with me again. I know. So, uh, so Amish, last time on the panel, uh, Dr. Mansi and Kripa Shankar were there. You were the one who was not there. So I'm going to point all the questions at you. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so the, for the, the others. Weakest, weakest student is asked the question first, and then the strongest student is asked second. So I don't mind answering first. <laughs> Nice, Amish. Very nice. Uh, so for people who are wondering what I'm referring to, Amish organized a brilliant program a week, 10 days ago, uh, where we had a detailed discussion regarding Keynote 522, who should have, who shouldn't have, and so on and so forth. And uh, quite a few of the panelists today, including Dr. Seema, who's in the next panel, uh, was part of that. So the point I'm trying to make is that if you're getting bored or bugged with this, please bear with me for the next 25 minutes. So that is what it is. Okay, so let's start with this case. 46-year-old uh, lady with a left breast lump for four months, <clears throat> no family history, no comorbidities. Uh, mammogram showed a Birad's four lesion in the, I'm sorry, that should be the left breast, three centimeter with the multiple axillary lymph nodes. The largest was 1.5 with loss of fatty hilum. Uh, a biopsy of the lump showed invasive duct carcinoma, uh, grade three. The immunohistochemistry was a triple negative cancer. An FNA of the axillary lymph node was done and that was metastatic carcinoma. The PET scan showed uh, no evidence of distant metastasis. There was just uptake in the left breast and the lymph node. So it was uh, carcinoma of the, I'm sorry, that should also lead as left breast. Uh, clinical T2 and two multiple lymph nodes were there. So that's why it was N2 and M0. Uh, Kripa Shankar, let's start with you. Uh, should you, in addition to the routine workup before chemotherapy, do you think this patient should be right away counseled for getting uh, the germline BRCA done? Yeah, definitely, sir. I think, uh, you know, in view of the current recommendations and the guidelines as well, and especially, you know, I given that we've had the publication from from uh, TMH as well by Dr. Sudeep Gupta. I mean, like, albeit in ovarian cancer, probably the incidence of uh, BRCA mutations is probably much higher in our subset as well. So I would definitely look at getting a BRCA testing done for this patient with triple negative breast cancer. So. Excellent. Dr. Mansi, is that uh, now routine in your practice that a patient like this would get a BRCA testing done? Yes, sir. I mean, I think although uh, for the initial first counseling session, I kind of leave that out because it is too much for the patient. Right. Kind of right. go but eventually, uh, yes, but before they finish their new adjuvant therapy, yes. Very good. Uh, Amish, I'm sure you're doing the same. You probably will counsel this lady and get a BRCA done as soon as possible, right? Because that can have implication on the surgery, that can have implication on uh, what you do post-surgery also, right, Amish? Absolutely right. Uh, Senthil, uh, just uh, this uh, BRCA has become now almost synonymous uh, in uh, almost the entire breast cancer TNBC journey. Like getting just CBC one, done, I suppose. Is it? Like we get CBC done. I just wanted to ask everyone, large deletion duplications are everybody, you know, offering because what happens that just point mutations in BRCA1, BRCA2 are available at a much cheaper rate. <sighs> Uh, when you you know combine the two, and the moment I combine, my patients go out, get it cheaper, and come back to me with the report. So just wanted, Senthil, okay. you normally are the moderator, but let me ask you this question. Sure, sure, Keep sure. For us, yes, for us, uh, it is uh, reflex testing, uh, Amish. That in our hospital we do uh, BRCA one and two NGS, and also there's an MLP that is done along with that. Okay. So we always do an MLP along. Uh, Dr. Mansi and Kripa Shankar. Uh, what is it that you do in your practice? Uh, do you do sequential testing or is it reflex that both are done? No, sir. So I think uh, uh, it would be nice to get a reflex test done, but it, it adds to the cost. And so right. what happens is that we don't get it done for everyone. If the test comes back negative and we still, if the patient is affording, I'll tell them to do it or otherwise there's a strong family history or strong clinical suspicion, then I'll okay. really push for it. But it's not reflex testing, unfortunately, at our place. Great. 
Kripa Shankar, because you're yeah, likely I, to miss uh, five to, you know, in some series up to 15% of patients with a germline BRCA if you just did, uh, you know, or if you didn't do an MLPA. So what do you do? Absolutely, sir. Like you rightly said, the large genomic alterations are likely to be missed out. So I, I mean, like most of the times I use the coupon for testing. Right. Either from Zydus or Astra. Makes sense. But, yes. uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, like I do add the MLPA as well. That comes at an extra cost. Correct. Maybe around 4,500 if you add the MLPA. But I definitely insist on, get, you know, doing both. Very good. So, I think all of us would prefer to do it, whether you do sequentially and or whether you do reflex. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's a question of, uh, you know, the center where you practice it. So, uh, the, the point is that we need to get all of this done. So, Amish, let me ask you, uh, who all patients with triple negative in your practice get uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy? Anybody about two centimeter. Okay. Uh, and if it is uh, lymph node positive, irrespective of the uh, size status. of the tumor, right. uh, they take. But I'm sure you are going to ask in this patient question uh, about NACT. Uh, so I will reserve for that moment. Okay, I'm going to ask because Dr. Mansi has given me the locally advanced breast cancer as the topic. So correct, I will, correct. That's that, why I was that'll come next. That'll come next. Okay, so uh, Dr. Mansi, this is one of the questions. One of the reasons, uh, you know, should I say uh, an emerging reason, at least in our country, for doing neoadjuvant chemotherapy, especially in a very chemo responsive disease like triple negative cancer, is can you do sentinel lymph node biopsy after doing neoadjuvant chemotherapy? Uh, so, do you do it in your center? Is it common practice or, uh, you know, we just don't do that. If you're not positive at the time of diagnosis, you end up having a, uh, you end up having a lymph node dissection. Do you do a sentinel lymph node in patients who become negative after neoadjuvant chemotherapy? So, so only for patients who are clinically node negative, but they have okay. like a small node on uh, ultrasound or imaging that the surgeon, uh, like you know, will do a biopsy of the node first and clip it, and then yeah. after that, the surgeon does the SLND. Uh, but anything that is clinically not palpable, as surgeons are still not comfortable uh, doing sentinel nodes. Okay. Uh, Kripa Shankar, uh, would you agree with Dr. Mansi that we are all still not comfortable doing sentinel lymph node, at least most centers? I wouldn't say all centers, I can't say that. Uh, that we are still not very comfortable with the sentinel lymph node after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Yeah, definitely, sir. I think that's not what standard of care is, definitely. Uh, so you would definitely, because 10% 10 post pickup rates can be there if you do it after, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a clinically node positive axilla. So I think that's the key drawback with that. But having said that, you know, the recent St. Gallen's recommendations also said, you know, if you could de-escalate therapy, I mean, like that was the main focus of the meet as well, said probably you could do it on a case-to-case -case basis. And it's got a weaker category of recommendation, even if you look at the NCCN guidelines as well. But definitely not category one, definitely not standard of care. Okay. So on a case-by-case -case basis, if it's yeah. possible and your center is happy to do it, you would uh, offer it to your patient. So I think as medical oncology, uh, you know, uh, as medical oncologists, this is something that we generally don't discuss with our patients, but I think a time will come when we will routinely discuss this as one of the advantages of doing new adjuvant as opposed to adjuvant chemotherapy itself. Amish, uh, we so, discussed. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mansi, please. Go since so, I mean, since we're talking about post new adjuvant, if the patient has a good response, I wanted to know about rate adjuvant radiation therapy. So, if a patient has undergone mastectomy and okay. has a YPT zero N zero, okay. I think we, we I have, the reason I'm also asking is because I just recently had a patient and there was a lot of back and forth and I think everyone was not on the same page and I just want to know if there's any institutional policies or practices. Uh, okay, so let me tell you what we do, Dr. Man. See, uh, if somebody has got a YPT0N0, uh, we don't alter the radiation uh, recommendation. The recommendation uh, would depend upon what uh, they started with rather than where they ended up with because there are some retrospective studies which show that the likelihood of recurrence continues to be high if you started with a bigger tumor, which means we are talking about a T3, T4, or if you started with lymph nodes that were positive. So I think as of now, the recommendation continues to be that you uh, you you do radiotherapy based on the stage at diagnosis rather than uh, whether you got a PCR or not. Uh, Amish, let me ask you about the ER poor tumor, Amish. So how do you handle them in practice today? So uh, outside the setting of a clinical trial, I treat them as triple negative whenever I decide about chemotherapy. But at the same time, if it is, say, 3% positive, say ER is, you know, just 4 by 8, PR is uh, 1 by 8, yeah, 2 by 8, I have to offer them hormonal treatment also after, according to CAP requirement. Uh, but I have the luxury of choosing the best of chemotherapy and treat them like TNBC chemotherapy. 
Excellent. So your chemotherapy choice is like TNBC. Your hormonal therapy choice is like the hormone receptor positive. Correct, That's correct. right. That's right. That's how I think most of us could uh, deal in a situation like that. Okay. I mean, she were wanting to answer this um, question. Yeah, my Dr. Mansi, please. Uh, no, Dr. Sandil, I think I just saw the message from Dr. Ilyas. So I don't know if he's still online, but I think he said that he might just stay back for the session. Oh, okay, so, great. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, is yeah, he, I uh, but on the list, are you able to see him? On, Dr. Ilyas? Yeah. Yes, he is there. Yes, I'm oh, oh, if, we'll be more than happy if you join the panel. We, Dr. Ovid, I'm to. sorry. I just saw your message. And, uh, you know, I, if you have the time, then I think it would be great if you... Uh, can stay back, uh, but it's totally up to you. Thank you. Not in that stay with. <laughs> okay, thank you. I don't have a meeting in, uh, in ten minutes, so uh, actually, I because I, I didn't have it on the calendar. So oh. you you're happy to stay, Doctor Elias? Or how long is it? Uh, because I, I do have a meeting. In no, I think please, please, please feel free to leave whenever you have to. It doesn't matter. We we uh, about that just because I didn't have it on the calendar. Okay, never mind. Never, never mind. Never mind. Please carry on if you're not very comfortable with, yeah, with sorry, respect to the time. Never mind. That's all right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Uh, Amish, next question was for you. You were wanting to get to this. What is the ideal neoadjuvant chemotherapy for this lady, Amish? My first question is, uh, Sentil, okay. my first point is not question, is you are supposed to ask questions. Correct. Whatever point. Germline BRCA mutated mutation lady with okay. age three A uh, breast cancer triple mm. negative. Mm. Uh, MRM is going to be the preferred option uh, in Olympia trial. Uh, if we look at the adjuvant chemotherapy along with uh, olaparib, uh, this may fit into that inclusion criteria. Of course, in in I am going to give new adjuvant chemotherapy to this patient, Senthil. Okay. My question is that in case sometimes if patient straight away undergoes, because I recently had one doctor who came from Bombay and the similar stage 3A got operated first and then came to me for chemotherapy. We are coming to that question a little so, later. So then, then, then I will not answer. I would yeah. like you to You just answer. tell me uh, what your new adjuvant strategy Those for this tens, will be. Uh, I start with weekly paclitaxel plus carboplatin followed okay. by dose dense AC. Uh, weekly paclitaxel carboplatin plus dose dense AC. All right. Uh, what about addition of uh, pembrolizumab, uh, Amish? Would you, patient can afford, let's say. Yep. Uh, so again, uh, the, uh, you're talking in this particular lady who's BRCA positive. Yes, in this lady who's BRCA positive. I would uh, offer, I would explain to patient about Olympia because Olympia with BRCA positive, uh, Olaparib has the highest stage 3 EFS, although uh, trial to trial comparison is very, very difficult, Senthil. But I will give the option of pembrolizumab versus adjuvant Olaparib to this patient. Uh, and depending on how they see, Olaparib is cheaper compared to pembrolizumab. If you, if you look okay, at it. so you're saying it's olaparib or pembrolizumab. Suppose I say, why can't it be olaparib <laughs> plus pembrolizumab? I don't have the data where they have combined so, the two together. So, so are you likely to get the data in the near future? You're not going to get it. I have no idea. If you no, say, no, I am telling you. I believe that you at will, least, at least <laughs> as much as I could search, there is no trial which is coming up where they have compared two versus one drug okay there are trials where they are combining but that's not comparing two versus one drug you know then like you you, you know usually pull my leg i will say there has to be olaparib on one pembro on one and the two <laughs> in the third arm so such a trial is never going to come amish right so i think we need to make up our mind based on whatever data is available so in that context we'll come to the combinations later but you're saying that since this patient is uh, braca positive you are not very tempted to use Pembro in this situation. Mansi, would you do that? Uh, no, I mean, I think if anything, if of course cost is not an issue, I'd probably want to add Ola Parib rather than switch to... Ola no, Parib. I'm talking about new adjuvant. We'll come to the adjuvant a little oh, bit. Okay, sorry, sorry. Um, what is I your choice? So if BRCA positive, locally advanced PNBC, is that yes. what you're asking? Yes, correct. So I think I would probably still use the new adjuvant immunotherapy. Uh, okay. um, right. So you would do Keynote 522. Correct. Right. Where you're using platinum, uh, anthracycline, and then the taxane. Yeah, everything. And of course, carboplatin. Throw everything. everything. Right. Kripa Shankar. 
Yeah, definitely, sir. I'm all in for key, Keynote five two two. Okay, Keynote five two two. Okay, so when we say uh, when we say there's a use of carboplatin, are you tempted to use carboplatin because this lady is germline BRCA positive, or is it because you want to do Keynote the five two two, or is it that you believe all TNBC should get platinum, Doctor Mansi? What is your temptation to use platinum in this lady? So I think so my temptation is more because uh, she's a higher stage uh, one BRCA positive, um, so two. And um, I don't use it in uh, patients who have, uh, you know, like an, like a small tumor volume. I, to be very honest, if they're BRCA negative, I don't use carboplatin. I just use the dose dense ACT. Okay, so your temptation to use partly is because this is germline BRCA that's positive. But, you know, when you nicely look at the brightness study, there wasn't much difference in patients who had a germline BRCA, carboplatin versus no BRCA or, you know, wild type BRCA and two carboplatin. So though we are all tempted to say that, uh, you know, carboplatin works better, there's good data in the metastatic setting, but there isn't good data to back up that claim, at least in the new adjuvant setting, based on the brightness data, which actually... Uh, looked at this issue also. Uh, Amish, is your temptation to use carboplatin because germline raka or is it because of the stage of the disease, Amish? And it's triple negative. Until you have nailed it, uh, brightness and keynote 522, I think after these two, I have just no doubt TNBC and I'll add platinum. TNBC and you're going to add platinum. So the point Amish is making is that the event-free survival that you got in the brightness for the addition of platinum is bang on the same 0.63 as you got with the addition of pembrolizumab in patients uh, with locally or high risk breast cancer, triple negative in the keynote 522. Again, cross comparison, uh, but he's absolutely right. So, uh, so two of our panelists want to do keynote 522. Amish wants to do, uh, you know, he doesn't want to do pembrolizumab because he wants to give this lady olaparib in the adjuvant setting. Agreed. Very good. So that's one way of looking at it. Okay. So Amish, this is another nice data. On one hand, uh, you know, we are talking about carboplatin kind of cementing its role in the neoadjuvant setting uh, after the brightness. This is not neoadjuvant setting, but this kind of for me was a little bit of a dampener. This is a little different story altogether. So these are patients who had neoadjuvant. And then if they had a tumor that was more than a centimeter residue, they were randomized to capecitabine versus carboplatin. And carboplatin actually could not really match even up to capecitabine. There was a lot of problem with the statistics, but having said that, and some problems with the design of the study itself, this was a little bit of a dampener. So, uh, Dr. Mansi Kripa Shankar, uh, would this impact your decision to use carboplatin in the new adjuvant? No, sir. So, I mean, it's a I different setting. It's a different great. setting. Sorry to be very honest. Okay, Kripa Shankar. Uh, um, sir, I've always been a huge fan of platinums because I Let's... believe the higher the path CR rates, the better it is because you get okay. to, you know, don't get to do response adapted therapy. Very I good. mean, like you don't have. So, so I, you're I, saying I... that I am trying to avoid usage of capecitabine by doing carboplatin early because you like carboplatin compared to capecitabine. Is that correct? No, I think uh, probably the higher the path CR rates, we've seen That's that what? translate into an EFS benefit as well. So okay. I, I would definitely look at it that way. So, so I would Excellent. definitely right. uh, look at using a platinum. Okay. So this data should not impact our use of carboplatin in the new adjuvant setting. This is adjuvant data. It does not do well in a patient who is high risk as defined by residue of one centimeter or more in the adjuvant setting. Sentinel. Sentinel. Yes, I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, this design is not bad. In fact, you know. It's, uh, it's good. <laughs> the, the problem is, was uh, there is no the, placebo in this so you cannot actually say that platinum was not uh, this thing it all says that the efficacy of platinum versus efficacy of capsidabin in this select group of uh, non path cr patients remained the same so, so, the, so they were trying to answer to do, that question this was a non-inferiority with a built-in superiority amish and you know based on the confidence intervals that they looked at they could not conclusively prove the non-inferiority of platinum in this study though the curves seem to be sitting one on top it's of the combined other with cape, uh, Senthil, not it combined is, not combined not no no combined. it is compared it is. with cape yeah it yeah it is which cape. is what which is what would be the standard at the time Absolutely. that this trial was designed isn't it? Yep, so yep, cape yep. remains cape remains king so uh, in the in this setting, it's not carboplatin. So this is just another data. Amish, we are coming to the point you made. You know the the recent doctor that you had who was operated. Uh, you know uh, who was operated in Bombay and came to you. You know this is something like you know I always uh, keep thinking whenever I see a patient who gets upfront surgery and comes. This is adjuvant capecitabine for a year in triple negative breast cancer. This is the Chinese study. 
you know yes. as far as we are concerned that's probably is the only negative issue yes, yes. <laughs> right <laughs> but look at the even free survival hazard ratio 0.64 Pembrolizumab is my 0.64 carboplatin in brightness 0.64 Jepar Nuvo 0.64 you know magic 0.64 capsitabin 0.64 and there is a nice meta analysis uh, 3800 patients showing that adjuvant capsitabin gives you not only improvement in EFS but also some improvement in the overall survival at least in my mind there's always been a little bit of hesitancy in adopting this Amish I you know I don't have a good answer as to why but let's say this doctor that has seen you today, would you be tempted to do capsitabin low dose? This is 650 milligrams per meter square twice daily, something that is possible in our patients so for there, one full uh, year. Yes. So I'll answer it in two parts. One, okay. in my yeah, yeah. routine practice, I show this Chinese paper and give 650 milligram per meter square and I'm very happy. Excellent. I'm glad. But, but if you open up CreateX, uh, first of all, this study, if I'm not mistaken, included only T1, T2, and I think node negative. All patients, all patients. I mean, all patients. There's a node positive yeah, also. So you can see on the forest plot here. Node positive, node positive. Yes, positive, node positive, yes. yes correct, correct. Sorry, sorry. So that's my mistake. Uh, second, CreateX, if you take out the forest plot chart, in stage 3 and stage 3B, the line crossed the unity. So, uh, uh, I'm not very sure that in today's topic of locally advanced breast cancer, the CreateX, uh, how much uh, to say. But to answer your question, I'm very happy with this study for Indian setting. I don't have to use 2,500 milligram per meter square, which none of my patients tolerate. 650 milligram per meter square for one year tolerated. The doctor I had already counseled and she excellent. has agreed for one year of Kepsita. Excellent, but excellent. But she's BRCA negative. Okay, if Amish is using all of us, we'll use it then. Absolutely fine. Dr. Mansi, <laughs> do you do this in your practices? Yes, sir. I think it's the dose is definitely better tolerated uh, compared to the Create X trial. The only caveat is the patient has to be ready to take it for one year. I think some patients, you know, when you say after they're done with all the hard work that they've done and then you tell them that you still have one more year of therapy to take, there is a little bit of hesitation. But uh, in terms of tolerability, it's definitely better than okay, the Kripa Okay, okay. Kripa Shankar, Vamsi has made a point more than a couple of times in the chat box <laughs> today. He's saying, why don't you choose Carbo over IO? What is your... Uh, you know, counter to it, or would you agree? Because you said keynote five two two. I want you to answer this question: Carbo or IO? So, uh, simply put, I would say Carbo plus IO. Excellent. So, once <laughs> Carbo plus IO is the way to go, it looks like. So, I think the the reason one of the reasons why they built up that chemotherapy backbone is also because carboplatin is supposed to be immunogenic, and whenever you see a study with carboplatin and an IO, you see that the PCR rates are much higher. We saw Jepar Nuvo, though the EFS benefit was very similar for a short course of IO in the new adjuvant setting that didn't have a platinum and the, and the PCR rates were lower by about 10%. I know we can keep arguing what's the difference that you need to see between the arms in order to get to a difference in the EFS, but that's a different story altogether. But Carbo seems to definitely increase the PCR rates, as Kripa Shankar said, that will help us... Uh, have lesser patients that we need to escalate our treatment for. Right. Uh, it seems that the use of carbo decreases the lower of PARP inhibitors. Excellent. Amit has uh, brought this point up. Uh, Amish, would you like to take that? I think he's referring to, uh, uh, he's referring probably to the forest plot in the Olympia, where about 20%. Amit, you can unmute yourself and ask that question. Is that right? Okay, ask the question. Yes, Amish, ask the okay. question. <laughs> ask the question. I'm not answering Amish. You, Amit will ask Amish. <laughs> okay, Amish, this is a question from you. Uh, uh, in Olympia, prior platinum was allowed, but how many percent did I 18 percent. 18 percent had. So very less data to answer that question. In, in ovary, we have been asking this again and again. And I know Sudeep strongly believes that all these solos would be uh, negative study if the maintenance carboplatin can be one of the arm. But Senthil, honestly, we, in, in this 18%, we don't have enough data for me to... I, I agree with you, Amish, that in 18%, we don't have. Uh, when you look at the Olympiad, you know, the metastatic setting study and the brocade, the use of platinum actually did not uh, negate the effect of PARP inhibitor, but whether it decreases, I'm not very sure about it. Those two know. studies I in the metastatic setting, but uh, uh, Amit is certainly uh, correct to a point 
uh, because in the adjuvant study, it looked like that uh, there was no benefit for patients who took uh, the platinum. But Amish is also right because that was 18% and I don't think we can Sandalbos. come to any conclusions. Yes, Sahu? Yeah, just one point. Uh, yes. If we are considering PAP at all in an adjuvant setting okay, uh, for, uh, for a BRCA positive, right? Uh, and we know that the uh, the test of heterogeneity was not uh, uh, significant for Correct. the uh, platinums. Correct. So why at all add added toxicity? So if you are not considering a pop at all in the adjuvant setting, the role of carboplatin does come in with the path CR and other things. I, I I understand what Amit is saying that if you achieve a path CR, probably you won't need a adjuvant pop. Correct. So I think Safu, we really don't know the answer is the correct answer to that question. It depends upon whether you are happy to do olaparib in that additional 15% of patients who would have achieved the path CR with addition of carboplatin in the new adjuvant setting, whether you are happy to manage the additional side effects of carboplatin in the new adjuvant setting, or are you comfortable with managing the anemia plus minus doubtful MDS and acute leukemia that can come with one year of olaparib. So I think it's a question of a choice that you have to make uh, sitting across the table with each of our patients. Because for me, I would be tempted to say, use the carboplatin increase your PCR that's cheaper and you will have less patients that you would have to escalate. That's just one way of looking at it. I don't think we have an answer, but I agree with Amish that, and of course you also, that uh, the test of heterogeneity was negative. So we can't come to any major conclusions as to whether carboplatin, uh, you know, brings down the effectiveness of PARP in the adjuvant setting. I think we can, you know, discuss that for hours together, but you won't get an answer to that question, at least based on, uh, you're right that carboplatin maintenance has to be compared to, uh, you know, olaparib maintenance. Again, the cost of olaparib comes, the toxicity of carboplatin comes here. So I don't think there's one answer to this. Uh, we will not discuss this because Amish brought up this point. And, uh, you know, the, the only question is, as we discussed for the 522, if you get a PCR, Amish, would you stop the immune checkpoint inhibitor? Now, uh, going by Durvalumab trial, you want me to uh, put my thought process for pembrolizumab. <laughs> Central Correct. Correct. That's one of the... No, <laughs> even in your 522, again, Amit made this point very nicely during your interview with him that the benefit is driven by the non-PCRs rather than the PCRs. So you can always you can always say, you know, it's not wrong to stop. Central, it's good to continue, Central, but it's not wrong to stop. age and world, if you have explained patient based on some trial... Agreed. Deep inside our mind, definitely want them to get dry up financially and stop pembrolizumab. But if they want to continue and the finances allow, how can we tell them to stop? Absolutely. Unless, I'm just asking you, would you be tempted to stop, not would you stop? I would want them so that they can come and tell me that, look, you know, we can't afford pembrolizumab further. Okay. And if they have bad CR, I'm happy. Excellent. Very good. So one question, last question is 8.30. I'll have to stop and hand it over to Sahu. Uh, again, the Durvalumab that you spoke in the Jepar New. So this was a slide that I made for a different meeting. I'm just trying to look at how to manage early TNBC in you know the, the people who are least privileged to people who are so very well privileged to get everything. But our chunk of patients would fall somewhere in between, right? Where we have some resources, but we don't have all the resources in the world. Again, Amish, since you spoke about, I want to ask this to all the three of my panelists before I close. I want you to take a look for five seconds on that, uh, you know, chart that I made there. Uh, you know, would you be tempted red to... box wala. Yeah, the red box wala. Correct. Red so box is wala. that, if I understand correctly, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, ACT plus carbo plus pembro. Just pembro in the neoadjuvant setting. Have huh. surgery. Hmm. If you get to PCR, just stop everything, right? Hmm. If you don't get a PCR, get to Cape Cytobin. No, right? I, this don't, is I for, don't agree. You I won't don't. agree. Excellent. So, so you will. If you, Amit Agarwal is here. I don't. No, 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 no. Just hang on. Hang on. Okay. I don't have money. I don't have money. I just have money for six months of par, uh, six months of Pembro. Okay. It's not a choice that we are making. It's because of force. Okay. I okay. don't have money to continue Pembro after six months. So in that case, would you be tempted to use Pembro in the new adjuvant? And then if you don't have a path CR, would you be okay to continue Cape Cytomen or you would tell this patient, no, don't start Pembro at all. No, I think, I think financial gives our, makes our lives much easier. I agree with your table. Sentence. You agree with my table. If, if there Dr. is no Mark. money, I agree with your table. But I, I'm talking about 
majority of patients who come with you know i've got x amount of money 15% more chance of fat cr uh, if they have money for just 6 or 8 pembro i would not miss that chance i completely agree with you excellent opinion. so you would not miss that chance mansi would you also not miss that chance i agree sir i mean i think this is uh, also kind of uh, an analogy for her to positive where you know i'd like to use new adjuvant for zeta even if the patient doesn't have like money to complete the whole adjuvant okay so. and then for that you can continue just the herceptin in the adjuvant so that you don't have to escalate to tdm1 something like that correct okay uh, kripa shankar yeah i mean definitely agree with that sir i mean like the patient got financial constraints i would look, look at uh, using it only in the new adjuvant setting okay. trying to get to a path cr and then going the capsid up in my i'm great like, i definitely agree with that okay very good lovely so we had some nice discussions this is my summary slide uh, for early or locally advanced i think all patients who deserve new adjuvant uh, should get new adjuvant anthracycline taxane based new adjuvant therapy Uh, I've just tried to look at the important points for each of these drugs. Capecitabine create X is important to follow. There's improved overall survival for triple negative, uh, clinically significant distant disease-free survival in the adjuvant setting. That's the Chinese study. So I think we all should consider this in our practice uh, for patients who have upfront surgery for triple negative breast cancer. As far as the platinum is concerned, we know it increases the path CR rates irrespective of the BRCA status. There's better event-free survival as shown in the brightness study, so that kind of uh, makes its place in the new adjuvant setting a little stronger. Uh, it cannot replace capecitabine for those who don't achieve a PCR, and that's based on the ECOG acrin that I showed. As far as PAL PARP inhibitor is concerned, olaparib is the adjuvant standard. We didn't have time to discuss whether you, if you can't afford olaparib, will you use rucaparib? That's the question that we can always think about. There's improved invasive disease-free survival benefit for the high-risk group in patients with a germline BRCA. Uh, there is no new adjuvant data, including for those with germline BRCA, because in the brightness, those 15% who had germline BRCA didn't actually have a benefit. But it's not power to look at that 15%. Pembro improved event-free survival with an anthracycline taxane carbochemotherapy when used in the new adjuvant and the adjuvant setting. So those are my carry homes or summaries for patients with locally advanced. Of course, please do not forget surgery and radiotherapy because they are equally important or probably more important. At least surgery is concerned. Thanks so much, Dr. Mansi, and I'll hand it over to you. Dr. Then, Dr. Dr. Mansi, Dr. Mansi, before Senthil goes, I think next time in the panel, and Tarini is also here. There was a movie called Curious Case of Benjamin Button or something. I think we should start with Senthil's last slide first and go to the first slide and then do the panel. So that you, what do you say? <laughs> so that you know the so that you know the answers to all the questions. Correct. <laughs> 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 nice, nice. Nice. This you know new all adjuvant. these guys are you know you know Amish and Sauk and Amit you know. We have actually grown up together that we can read every each other's mind. Yeah, I know, Doctor Amish was like, I know this is what you want me to say, and Correct. then this Correct. is what I'm going to say. But anyway, yeah. lovely, always, uh, you know, lovely time when all of us get together. Mansi was saying something. Me. I think. Yeah, Mansi, please go ahead. Oh no, I, I was saying there's. I don't remember the exact study, but there was this new adjuvant telosuperib study. I think for. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Yeah. Um, TNBC patients which showed an impressive PAT CR. I think single agent. So correct. So uh, so the problem is that uh, you know valiparib. Know. They'll say talisoparib has got a lot of PARP activity. Then they'll say valiparib is not a PARP inhibitor at all. You know, all this will come <laughs> when it doesn't uh, show the expected results. Anyway, never mind. I think that's the way uh, oncology works. Sure. Uh, thanks so much, Mansi, Thank and you. I hand Thank it over you. back to you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. uh dr tp sahu so i think the stage is yours uh, for discussion on early and metastatic hormone positive breast cancer um yeah. if i can invite dr vamshi krishna and dr seema gulia and i'm sorry for like making it this such a broad panel but um, you know i think there was some interesting data in early setting and uh, some new data on survival benefits for cdk46 inhibitors that had come up and so i had to kind of mix and match these two topics so that i would have to like, like try to keep it separate but uh dr sahu so yeah i'm sorry for that yeah it's okay so uh seema is there yes i'm here dr sahu yeah chalo now vamsi i saw him yeah vamsi you're right and uh, gradually we all feel that uh, uh, even if you look at the suitant uh, in the rcc uh, we all criticized that because of the os benefit is not there we took out the adjuvant 
and suddenly you find all the other immuno uh, immune checkpoints coming in so that is going to happen i think the os is now less talked about uh, so uh, you put that in the chat and i feel uh, the goal post is shifting gradually and uh, so now we come down and it was a, this is a long topic actually it is now the early and the um, advanced hormone positive so i might be making some uh, i might be highlighting some points could be missing some because in half an hour panel i could take up some of the things which i felt is clinically relevant so i'll come down very quickly to three parts in the early breast cancer and uh, what i look at a hormone is uh, who would not receive chemotherapy that point question number 1 second which i felt was appropriate still not practiced in india is who is eligible for extended hormone therapy so these are the two questions which i felt was very apt for the uh hormonal part and the adjuvant uh, cdk uh, four six is the three questions i could put in up for the early breast cancer for hormone positive so uh vamsi first you what percentage of a patient do not receive chemo i'll start off with my part very few do afford the molecular testing and it comes down to that uh, of the testing of the 10 patient which i do two patients do not receive chemotherapy for some reasons uh, because of the test and other things so that's what is the things with me what is uh, about what is in your practice man sir so if you are talking of total er er positive patients i think probably less than 10% would be 10 to 20% i agree with be the same number in my okay and, and 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 can you take the second one who are these patients uh, really uh, would be the same classical do you differentiate between a premenopausal i'll put you a more specific question a uh, third 40 years old premenopausal single node positive uh, grade 1 erpr positive her to new negative has a recurrence score of 13 or 14 versus recurrence score of 18 or 20 uh, what would be your thing would you even uh, consider a node positive premenopausal for a recurrence score at all that's the point number one if yes what is the cut off okay lots of questions in that uh, simply put okay let's go to one scenario where there is no recurrence score and no oncotype anybody who has a node positive will get chemotherapy anyone more okay. than 2 cm and a premenopausal will get chemotherapy that's for so for so for you all premenopausal node positive you would not send a recurrence score and no no, no. Be... i'm saying where recurrence score cannot be sent where like okay. you said most patients can't afford it so without okay. sending it what is the data what what am i using as a surrogate for the oncotype so okay. that's where i do it now coming and to uh, part of, yeah. and the mamap do you use only the um, do you have a do you put the mamap rate also into the picture or it's only oncotype for you uh after the mind that yes i am think i am trying it but my experience is more with oncotype i am okay. comfortable with it that's all okay okay i i want this specific question to come to suma seema seema node positive single node uh 2.5 cm premenopausal 40 years the same question would you consider for a recurrence score or a mamap print let's say whichever you choose as per the data or would you still make all this patient eligible for chemotherapy in this particular case i would not even consider sending it for any molecular testing okay be it on cotype dx or be it mama print and okay. i'm not i mean i am not doing this this gene expression analysis in routine practice as well okay so for you all premenopausal node positives are out and you would be very very strict on giving some amount of chemotherapy to get the benefit mansi what is your take on it in a private practice So, if the patient is willing for oncotype BX, I will offer oncotype BX to this patient. Um, if not, then chemotherapy. Okay. Uh, so, uh, oncotype BX node may positive. The data is not there. The mama print one to three is where the data really comes from. The we have the. Uh, uh, res, uh, okay. Uh, we'll come to that. I'll take the Sandil question. Uh, he told that you, irrespective of the uh, premenopausal nodes, you would get some benefit. The benefit is something like. Three percent, so uh, so that's why Zendil says that he would not be sending. So I, I think that they. Like, yeah, yeah, small, sorry to interrupt, Sahu. There is actually a yeah. small overall survival benefit also. The score, yeah. irrespective of whether it is five or twenty-four, they continue to benefit. Whether they have one node or four nodes, they continue to benefit from chemotherapy. So the responder. clearly showed that in premenopausal patients irrespective of the score irrespective of whether you have one node or four nodes all these patients benefit from chemo so if you got a node positive it's the postmenopausal who you should be sending for the recurrence score so is uh, it that i can read it separately sandil if you are there uh, if i do a mama print 
the responder do not apply if i do the oncotype it applies so the problem with mama print is that only 20% of those patients were node positive so i don't know whether the data as far as node positive in mama print is really the high level data if you ask me which is the you know level 1 i would say mm -hmm. the rx ponder and oncotype dx is what it is and this is something okay. that i am talking from uh, oncotype dx not really okay. so dr mansi i think yeah. that data was between 11 to 25 so correct if it's I more think... than 25 anyway you would get us yeah if it's more so 11 to 25 oh, i think they said that menopausal women may than... benefit may have some benefit from chemotherapy but if it is less than 11 then i'm not sure that we have data to suggest that there is benefit of chemotherapy <laughs> So, Dr. Uh, can I just clarify one thing? You are speaking of only node positive. So, yes. node positive, node positive, node positive. Pre no, node positive. Node negative, you would still send the test and yes, not. Yes, yes. Oh, yes, okay. yes. yes. What, what, doctor, what Dr. Sendil spoke was the node positive and the data what he spoke was in, in context to the uh, oncotype. The MAMA print is creating the buzz and the confusion coming in the MAMA print. The one, two, three nodes in the low risk, uh, they're finding it that the benefit is not that much. and a 20% of a 6000 odd patient lot is a quite a big number so on that context then i'm very sure we are not trying to look at the ultra low risk type mansi uh, do you uh, think that this risk type occurs in our practice because if we are doing not doing mama print this we will never know this risk type and this risk type is around 15% of the total patient load and this is not a small number so what is your take because this is something which might evolve over the time so i think uh, because we don't have many patients who opt for these tests i just don't think we have enough data for indian patients to comment i agree okay. agree uh, that is true uh, uh, seema you're thinking on the future once the patient uh, once the test become affordable 15% of the total cohort of the breast cancer er positive would not benefit even from a hormonal therapy and that's your ultra low risk type what is your take on this early days still need more data because this data has come from starting from the late where stockholm 3 data came where they found that some patients in that group did not benefit even from a tamoxifen adjuvant so i think we are still in the early days and eventually in future we'll come to know whether we can really identify these ultra low risk type who don't even need hormonal therapy and regarding this mama print in that mindec trial patient who were clinically high risk irrespective of their genomic risk they had 1.5% absolute benefit with chemotherapy agreed so if i have a patient who is clinically high risk i won't even bother to send their mama print or any other uh, gene expert. would it would it not be very prudent on our part to discuss this 1.5 percentage benefit no because I... this is the benefit which we did not offer chemotherapy for stage 2 colon cancer Yeah, that one point five percent we I would not offer. So why are these two parameters so different when it we shift cancers? Uh, what I mean to say is that if I know that patient is clinically high risk, even mm -hmm. without sending the mama print, we can explain mm -hmm. it to the patient that clinically yeah. this is the risk, and if the benefit is too little, we can take that decision whether to give chemotherapy and not to give chemotherapy based on the clinical risk factor rather than sending okay. mama. I agree. Uh, I, I, I I take your point, and I think most of our practice is based on that. Also, till now, uh, we are changing gradually. Vamsi, this ultra low. Do you think this is a reality? Because if you look at the data, there is something that is in this subset which does not benefit from hormone, does not require chemo. Definitely, no RT even required. I am not very sure we can fully you know go with it. I I agree with Seema that at this point I think clinical okay. risk factors will need to be also considered. I would be a little uncomfortable just hunting for this ultra low and just saying don't do anything at all. I mean I'm a little scared. Okay. So uh, if you look at this point which I wanted to make, this is something very important. If you look across the data, the ASCO there was a, a presentation on this, but this is something I think in our practice will take few years to come by. Uh, this is what uh, Sandeep Levan spoke the RX ponder, and the uh, this is what it was that it does not really much apply to the node positive. But look at the mama print that the where the confusion happens. But if you're looking at the oncotype, you really would not look at the node positive and just would consider chemotherapy. Do not send even a gene testing. So now, Bamsi, for you, extended hormonal therapy, yes. If yes, for whom? And who are the patient really who you would not consider for extended hormonal therapy quick answer 
So uh, more than extended, I am actually looking at a switch kind of maintenance and trying to make okay. sure that I can give both. That is more important for me. So, so duration. Correct. So coming to that. So duration yeah. wise, two and a half, two and a half is good enough. But if patient is tolerating not having a problem, I would probably go on to seven to ten, as per their tolerance. It then is as per the tolerance. Yeah. So if their patient okay. is not having any complaints, I would continue to seven to ten years. Mansi, your practice uh, for extended hormone. So for high risk patients, uh, I definitely consider longer duration of therapy more than oh, five years. And and whom do you consider the high risk here? Yeah. So high risk patients, basically, uh, you know, so uh, as per the soft trial, I think thirty five, mm. less than thirty five years of age, any patient who received chemotherapy, patients okay. who have low ER PR expression, and uh, of course, a node positive. Um, multiple okay. positive. So okay. more than Seema, more positive. your take on extended hormone because it for months it's high risk uh, the ASCO defines it little more broadly so what is your take on extended hormone because Mamsi yes but if it tolerates he would consider for extended hormone for patients who have clinical at presentation up to T2 N0 I will give 5 years of hormonal therapy those who are node positive Heavily node positive, there I would try to give for 10 years. And as Manchi, as Vamshi suggested, switch therapy is possible. Mm -hmm. And if patient, AI is postmenopausal to begin with, I try to give them AI at least 7 .5, up to 7.5 years if they are node positive. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yes. so, okay. Dr. Tau, can I just ask? Yeah, yeah, please. T2 N0, 5 years tamoxifen is fine, or you would want to go for 10 years tamoxifen? That is something so, which is again a doubt for me, you know. Yeah. So if there for 10 years of tamoxifen versus five years of tamoxifen, I look at the basically other risk factors like whether we have given chemotherapy or not, or whether patient is pre-menopausal, pre-menopausal early age, like between 35 to 40 years. There I try to give tamoxifen more for more than five years. But if the patient is 48, 49 years of age. Two centimeter tumor, no LVI at five years. I stop them off. Okay. Uh, the ASCO broadly puts it all what has been told, and basically the take home could be the as per the ASCO. Although we have to look at the bone osteoporosis part very very carefully. There has been an anastrozole trial just recently published where the toxicities were much more, and even the Austrian trial, uh, the sixteen, if I'm not wrong, the ABC, uh, the sixteen trial told us that there was a lot more bone toxicity. So, but the ASCO puts it. Anything beyond two centimeters, node positive, would be a candidate for extended hormonal therapy. So the, the other parts have been already discussed. So, but we have to take it patient-wise, and we have to individualize the patients because there are toxicities, and some patients do not tolerate extended adjuvant. But this is where it is as per the thing. But this is what I wanted to put, put out, and you will see this coming more often because to take away chemotherapy it took us ten years, and if you look at this, the low risk and the ultra low. I'm not harping upon it because I do. I have done maybe, maybe three mammo print in the last one year. But what I mean to say is, look at the ultra low, no benefit at all from adjuvant hormone. And this is a good significant 15%. I think this data is going to come back and it has been proven across two or three trials. So this is something which I wanted to uh, leave the uh, all the panelists the thought with. Uh, is this what the future is? That we would not be giving hormone therapy even to a select patient who would not uh, benefit from adjuvant hormone. So now coming to the last part of early, Mansi, the, have you started Abima, or do you consider even ad, adjuvant CDK four six in your practice? So I, I have started counseling patients. Patients okay. who have uh, multiple nodes positive are you know more than five centimeters uh, tumor mm -hmm. size uh, mm -hmm. for adjuvant Abima cyclic. Okay. So anyone uh, you have any patients on board till now? So I, I mean, we participated in the Monarchy trial. Our center was uh, okay. as one of the participating center, and we had around eight to nine patients in the Monarchy trial. Okay. So, so have you, uh, so have you changed? Have you had any patients in the real practice? Uh, one patient in the real practice, okay. and that patient is particularly because she was most node positive, and we could not give her chemotherapy. So, okay. so, ba so basically you, okay, okay, I got yeah. it. So, so are you convinced about the data? Uh, would you, do you think it is right time to switch over to an adjuvant CDK4? No, I don't think because it is too early because if we look at panel of B trial at three years, it has shown a benefit, but at five years, the benefit was lost. 
if for okay. monarchy it is only the early result though i recently they have presented three year di i invasive disease free survival data also mm -hmm. it is promising but i think we have to wait till five years data it may change like for panel of b so uh one more question i wanted to ask because gradually as namsi told and that's bothering me we always have uh, were brought up in medical oncology to telling us that os is the gold standard but gradually in the adjuvant i feel the shift is towards the uh, uh, disease free survival now and the invasive disease free survival even that we saw in the adjuvant uh, parp inhibitor trial dolaparib so sima is the goal post shifting as mamsi pointed out in different context and putting in this context because most of the approvals are based on without os data now in early cancers even in metastatic let's say but in early people have the argument that if you do uh, achieve a disease uh, life without disease it's good enough you might not get a chance if the disease comes back what is your take on that yeah i still believe that the most important the hard end point is overall survival mm -hmm. but i do accept the fact that nowadays more and more emphasis is put on the disease free survival in advanced setting because os may not proven to be benefit beneficial or it will take longer time to prove its benefit so i think everybody is on uh, in a hurry to accept a new drug so based on that they are changing the goal post ram ji your points because i think this is a very pertinent question and i see once dr sudeep gupta told this that the dfs is more important adjuvant people have shifted and start the tones have started to change how they have told because dr sudeep is a great teacher and i think the trials also shifting that way he has a valid point what do you think uh, is the way we were taught changing and the things are now quite different see it's basically what you are learning i think over the years we have found that dfs is probably a a better robust data uh, as um, surrogate for os that's the reason we are shifting it's not that okay. we are, what we were taught was wrong that time we learned that os is the most important now we know that even a dfs can probably be acting as a decent surrogate for that os which is why so you are so you are convinced about the abima i'm not convinced i'm not convinced i'm not convinced why about why, thing, why again you know it seems look at the differences you're seeing you're seeing difference of 2% 3% and then you need to give a drug for more than one year for it you know uh, it it ultimately what i feel is the patients who are anyways going to do well end up getting the drug and you end up over treating a big section of patients for a very uh, no but but to be fair to monarchy they only chose the very high subset and it they chose the n2 they True. chose n2 or n1 with a with a risk factor with a grade 3 key more than 20% i mean these are a bit arbitrary cut off you know 20% okay. Okay. why 20 why not 25 why not 15 and you know uh, these are questions which you have to ask at some point of time so again i will offer it to the patients like mansi okay. says if you know the right patient comes you would probably talk about it i wouldn't go out of my way to push it out or you know i feel bad that why have i not treated this patient so that's okay. the way i look at it so mansi would it be then good to uh, end up this part of the part that adjuvant cdk46 the data looks uh, divided at this point but monarchy the right high group patient probably there is a benefit but because of the cost the toxicity and the discontinuation rate to be taken part you would choose your patients very carefully but there is some advantage but we would look at longer follow ups i agree i think i think uh, with all these newer agents we kind of use our clinical judgment to kind of uh, okay. pick and choose our patient so yes i don't think we apply the eligibility criteria strictly you know Mm -hmm. but i think with such a short benefit i think people have to apply the eligibility criteria and see what happened to the adjuvant uh, palbocyclic we just failed the trial no, so i mean like patients yeah, yeah, so, you know just for a ki67 more than 20% i mean i won't give a bemacyclic versus patients no, no, it, who have it, it, more it, it, than four is actually points. yeah it's okay i got it it's basically the ki67 uh, story living apart i think they're looking at uh, node positive uh one to three they're looking at one more risk factor that's the gross take home message and beyond three nodes they're taking okay let's now uh, put it at high risk so now we move on to the metastatic setting because i felt this was the three most important uh, adjuvant uh, hormone things which i wanted to discuss so now case one very short i know few repetitions we would have done in last few years some of these questions we have a 67 years old female present to opd multiple over bony mets without any fracture limited to the thoracic and ls spine the breast right lump 
oh, is there. We have a CT scan, thorax and abdomen, which is within normal limits. So my basic point is we have a bone limited disease and the patient has mild pain, may not be applicable for radiotherapy. You may give radiotherapy. That's a different part. We are going to skip that question. True cut biopsy is IDC grade 2, ER 6 by 8, PR 3 by 8, HER2 is negative. So that part is very, very clear. So this is the brief summary, postmenopausal stage 4 breast cancer, hormone positive, bone limited disease. Namchi, what is your most appropriate treatment? Would you go and add a CDK4-6 to your hormone or do you feel we can reserve the CDK4-6 to a later point of time? I would add it. I would give it in the first line. And which is your uh, hormonal agent, uh, fulvestrant or a letrozole? Letrozole. Letrozole. Pamansi, your choice? I agree. Hit up, Pamansi. So these are the two first line choices which you would like to give. Uh, Seema, uh, what do you think? Yeah, letrozole with CDK4-6 inhibitor. Okay, uh, letrozole with CDK4-6. So uh, Parsifal is not applicable for our practice as in yet. And do you think that Pulvestrant uh, giving for a longer duration injectable without any superiority benefit, I would still preserve the oral tablets, the dual oral tablets. Vamsi, is that the th thinking process? See, if you're adding so the CDK4-6, then your mm -hmm. partner says that Pulvestrant won't give you any advantage over... Uh, a, 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 so it's it's they're equal they're equal yeah so it doesn't give you an advantage but you can yeah. reserve your full restraint for later next line along okay. with the alpalism so that's why but if you are asking a scenario where a patient cannot afford a cdk4 and you ask mm -hmm. me to choose between the two then in this situation mm -hmm. probably as per falcon i would go with a full so okay so so this is what i think about i will leave this because this has been done the falcon is what i thought about and look at this pfs and the falcon PFS of bone alone disease without visceral disease is around 22 months. Mansi, does it not remind us of the CDK46 PFS? For an Indian scenario, uh, would you just not think? Because I, I agree that the CDK46, the bone PFS is again beyond 30 months. So that is also to be taken in context. I agree, but I think then we are also looking at uh, overall survival data that has come up. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that is what pushes us more. Although okay. we don't know whether, you know, leaving it for the second line, how much is the overall survival. But anyways, I think it's the overall survival part. And we do have patients in clinical practice on CDK4-6 inhibitors that will go on for, you know, four or five years. I agree. I usually don't see with full rest and single agent. Uh, Seema, question to you. In the practice where very few can afford a CDK4-6 even today, uh, would it be very nice on us to give uh, anastrozole and a full western combination for this subset of patients with bone alone disease? Because yeah. the OS looks very impressive to me. A 50 month Please. OS is something. Actually, we, I mean, I'm doing this in clinical practice as well. Patients okay. who are tamoxifen naive mm -hmm. and presenting only with bone metastasis. So we have few patients who are on a combination of anastrozole with full western and they are doing okay. better. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Vamsi, your, your, your thoughts on this? Because if no CDK4-6, then this is my choice. It's a good option. I, I mean, I personally keep okay. this choice more for a situation where, you know, my follow-up is going to be very bad. I know that if I send off the patient for 12 months, they'll continue to take full western, but they'll never follow up. So maybe in a scenario like that, I would combine it, but not as a routine right now. Okay. I would still uh, alone. Okay. Uh, so if you look at it, this is what it is all about. Even the previous endocrine therapy, which Dr. Seema told, if you look at this point, that if there's a prior, uh, no endocrine therapy, this combination is actually, the hazards is very, very nice. And I think the CDK46 plus the AIs would be a standard of care, point taken. But if they cannot, which is the majority of the patient load in most of our practices, this agent or a falcon-like regimen could be a good option. So point, this is the Parsifal. We spoke about it. All of us know about it. The point what the panel is making, I think, uh, Seema uh, Mamansi, that's what it is, that the, you do not use a Parsifal just because it was not superior. You want to reserve the full west stand for second line. And more so, you do not want to prick, have two pricks every month because it is a continuous pricking thing which goes on for at least two years, two and a half, three years. Who knows how much? Okay, okay. Okay, okay. So now, Comment on this one. And I am very interested with this data, Seema. If you look at this data, and this is more of a point why we should be reserving probably full western for second line. If you use a palbocyclib and AI, and if the relapse happens within the first six months, which is very, very unlikely, 
the chances of getting a esr mutation is quite low to around 18% but in a fall, relapse after 6 months the esr mutation rate comes to around 53% huge nearly every alternate patient would be having a esr mutant so taking the other point into context that the esr mutation is much more common in a metastatic deposit would it be also a point in favor of because we do not have the newer esr mutation uh, antagonist would it be now still more makes it a more sensible point that give letrozole and reserve pulvestrin for the later part yes completely agree with you on this okay so because this data i feel is something that really has i picked up and i found it very fascinating within 6 months and after 6 months the esr mutation really changes so manchi uh, in a private practice probably little more affordable patient would you be looking at this mutation on relapse for all your hormone positive patient do you do it in practice to be very honest i don't okay uh, do you think now this data pushes you to do it look at it how the data for indian patient look like yeah i think if uh, if possible then it it would be nice to collect this data and see actually because my go to choice for patients who progress on ai plus tdk6 is to do full western plus either alpelesib or full western plus evrolimus um, okay i usually don't use full western single agent okay so this patient took anastrozole to had three lung deposits bone metastasis so it's a frank progression not oligo progression so we did a pic3 mutation and that was positive so when this patient our choice definitely would be a alpelesib with pulvestrin vamsi you are there would did uh, vamsi oh he's gone out so sima uh, would a uh, uh, bolero type of thing a matter for you would you look at this bolero type of thing in this part of the question if they cannot afford a uh, alpelesib See if they cannot afford alpes, alpes, I mean any PI three K inhibitor, yeah. then yeah. actually initially I have used lot of Everlimus in two thousand fourteen fifteen. Okay. But by looking at the toxicity and poor tolerance of our patient, I have literally stopped using Everlimus now. Okay. In that case, I would consider giving capsitabine because okay that is far better tolerated and that and has better response rate. Okay, uh, hang on, Sima and Mansi. Look at this point, and look at the PIK three mutated, and look at the PFS, and look at the uh, exemastine and the exe everolimus and exemastine with the PIK three mutation. The data is disastrous. So basically, if you have a PIK three, this combination would is not a very good. The curves really separate out. So is it the point because I see many of our colleagues do practice this regimen for those who cannot afford a PIK three inhibitor. So, do you think this data is there now? Not maybe the best of evidence, but whatever we have from the Bolero, that if you have a pick three, you this combination really is a very inferior combination. And what Sima told, I would rather prefer a capsitabin based chemotherapy. Yeah, I agree. And this patient also didn't get CDK four six, right? In the first line. Yeah, so yeah. Assuming yeah. that she's not going to get second line. I, 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 I agree. I agree. I agree. We would prefer that. I, I, but, I otherwise but otherwise, capsitabin. But otherwise, capsitabin. Yeah. Vamsi, we lost you out for a minute. Uh, my point again is, uh, if we, there's a pick three, the patient is CDK four six if we exposed. Uh, would you consider bolero type of uh, the regimen? And the, the point which Sima told is, she is not very happy with the toxicity of everolimus. She considers chemotherapy to be a better option in this patient. What is your take on it? Agree. Okay. So uh, I just took up this point, the last point which I think, uh, Mansi, when do you consider chemotherapy after everything has failed? or you would consider chemotherapy for someone as the, our patient who did not receive a cdk46 let's say in the first line and received a full vest in second line or a cdk46 he never received in the first line would you consider capsidabine ever before so cdk46 before cdk46 no yeah, not before yeah. cdk46 i mean okay. it, if the patient is not going to take cdk46 or if it's been pre treated then i would choose capsitabine but not um uh, nancy your choice on this question again i mean uh, the, if the uh, typically we go with the cdk4 first or with the okay. ai first now then cdk4 i mean you exhaust all your endocrine before going yeah. on to chemo i can you comment on this one it's a very nice phase 3 trial we can yeah. comment and discuss and everything we can do it we can condemn it 
but this is only one of the few phase three trials which is there. The phase two pearl did show an advantage of the CDK4-6 inhibitors over chemo. And when you look at it on a phase three randomized, the cohort one and cohort two, which was eximustine palbo, and the cohort, other one is pulvestrin palbo versus capsitabine. And look at what it is. It was not better than capsitabine. So what is your comment on this? So this does give you the inclusion. If you look at it, it just had to fail one and not AI. So if we, the, what I get out of it, if you have not given CDK4-6 in the first line, you, the patient has really could not afford probably. I think you should not be feeling bad because the sec, the, this trial does give you the idea that capsitabine is a very strong re, re, regimen in this uh, setting. So, you know, I, I don't know if you can completely agree with that. See, these are basically okay. resistant patients. You look at the inclusion criteria. All are mostly resistant patients. Where okay. you know that probably a ribo or a ebima is stronger there. And mm -hmm. I think that's where we need to focus on. The ribo or the ebima will also show similar results. Then I can say, uh, I don't okay. know how to more, explain it more than that. I am still not okay. trying to this data. I, 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 I take a point. Mansi, your, 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 your thought on this trial and then Seema and then let me know. So I, so I agree with Dr. Vamshi that, you know, these patients are not really endocrine, like really very good endocrine sensitive patients. And mm -hmm. in those patients, um, you might not see a great benefit of uh, parbocyclib with fulvest. And I think the, the most strongest data we have for these endocrine resistant type of patients are with abemocyclib. Um, so, so uh, Seema, you take the same thing that if there is an endocrine within one year, it is not good enough to add something and a probably costly option is not good. Capsidabin is good enough. If it is beyond one year, then we can think of adding a CDK4-6. Yeah, I think I would take it as that if, if a patient cannot afford CDK4-6 inhibitor, then capsidabin is a reasonably good drug. But there okay. are many flaws with this trial. First of mm -hmm. all, it was designed as a superiority trial. Then they changed the cohort. The, I mean... CDK46 partner is not the most, I mean, Abhima Sikli would have been better as Vamshi suggested. I agree, I agree. Yeah, but okay. we can also take away that CDK46 inhibitor will do at least as reasonable as capsidabine. So they can be two takeaways from this trial. Okay. So I think uh, I tried to just get in. Uh, so one more last question I, out of curiosity. Mansi, have you tried tamoxifen with a CDK46? I have. I have tried tamoxifen, ribocyclib. In okay. Patients. The Mona Lisa Seven One. You wanted to do that one. Yeah. And how how has been experience with that? Because it did show a numerically inferior data to uh, the AIs. No. So eventually, those patients I have switched over to OFS plus AI. I mean, I might start okay. them off with okay. tamoxifen okay. ribo, but okay. eventually, all premenopausal patients have switched to OFS plus AI. With okay. CD. So so you have done that, but you're still very comfortable with the AI part of it. Yeah. So that's what you. Vamsi, you have done uh, the tamoxifen ever with the TDK46? Or Seema, if you're there, please take it. Uh, I don't think that I have no. tamoxifen with uh, any CDK46. Okay. Uh, I, why I brought up this question is four years back, people used to tell that because of the cardiac toxicity, tamoxifen with CDK46 was not a big no. But gradually the data is evolving and we do find now tamoxifen. A lot of data is there now with the CDK46. So that is the last point which I want to discuss. And this is where I end. And this is probably what the panel really told all the esteemed panelists. That if it's a very highly endocrine sensitive, then I think that's the one year mark is what people really brought out in the last trial, the PEARL trial. And if it is highly endocrine sensitive or endocrine naive, you just look at the uh, NSAIDs plus CDK46 Pulvis strand, bone only, uh, falcon or pulvis strand plus anastrozole is something which in the Indian scenario, I feel very fascinating. The data is quite strong and we should not just shy away from offering the patients this because I think only 10% patient, of patients, maybe less than that, afford a CDK46 at this point of time. If there's a PIK3 mutation, the pulvis strand or the letrozole, whatever you have used because we have data that you can interchange the first and second line. And we, we know that alpha-lysip would be used at this point of time. We need to look at the blood sugars very, very carefully. The diabetic uh, uh, to complications in the pre-diabetics, poorly controlled, it is a big, difficult drug to give. I remember Dr. Sudeep's word that alpha-lysip 
is a drug in between uh, the Everolimus and the other AIs. He put it that way, that that is the, the hardness of giving alpilocin. If not, if there's a big pick three wild type, I think Mansi brought up this full strand plus Everolimus. But if you are not comfortable with Everolimus as a drug because of toxicity, as Seema told, I think capsidabine is a good option. But if the patient has not done with the frontline key hormonal therapy, is relatively endocrine resistant, I think chemotherapy can be pushed to the front lines. So with that, if there is anything that the point requires to be made, Dr. Seema first and Dr. Mansi, and if YMC is there, then and then I hand over the, the, it back to Mansi. Seema, anything else you want to make? Any point? Not really. Yeah, come Not on. Really. Yeah. Mansi, anything? You know, I think I think uh, you did a great job. I think you covered everything that actually the early breast cancer, you know, whatever needed to be discussed. So that is very well okay. covered. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Mansi, for uh, considering me. And uh, it was a great learning uh, thing for me. I had to read a lot, uh, update myself. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saul. Thank, thank you, Dr. Gulia, uh, Dr. Vamshi Krishna. I think he's off. But thank you, everyone. Uh, I think it was a great discussion. And... Uh, Thank you, everyone, for staying back till the end. Dr. Ashish Koshal, if you're there, if you want to say anything, or I think we end the evening. So Dr. Sendil has put up the thing. So there will not be benefit from sending a recurrence score. That's what, again, he has put it up. And I agree, Sendil boss, we go to you. And for anything not positive premenopausal, I will not dare to even consider or discuss that. <laughs> Yeah, so that is something that I learned because I think I'll have to go back and read my data uh, on that. The, 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 the Alex Ponder is there, what he told. But once you start looking at the Mamapin data, actual confusion starts happening because Mamapin took 20 to 20% patients with one to three nodes. That's where yeah. the confusion starts because the uh, the Alex Ponder used the Oncotype and which did not have a node positive part at all. The publication is yet to come. So that is where it looked like the Alex Ponder, if it's node positive, do not consider. That's what Sandil spoke about. But I am not sure uh, the answer is as simple as that. Maybe next year, if you do this panel, it might change. Correct. Correct. Thank you, Dr. Sam. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.